Makerere Institute of Social Research online, this series of seminars, which we call Global Conversations, uh, mainly because uh, COVID-19 has opened up a possibility for us. Uh, people who are otherwise, uh, who would have been too busy to, to uh, take a flight, uh, spend uh, anything up to a few days or a week, in Kampala um, are not too busy to give uh, three hours of their time. And uh, so it's opened up for us a, a big window on the world. Uh, at the same time, it's also made it possible for others not in Kampala to join the conversations. So welcome to all of you. While we wait for uh, Professor Spivak, um, Javi, you'll please tell me when uh, Professor Spivak uh, joins us on this platform. Uh, so while we wait for Professor Spivak, uh, yeah. let me just... Uh, hey, Mahmoud, hi. Me, oh, hello, 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 yes. <laughs> Gayatri, welcome. Um, well, I was just, I was just uh, welcoming everybody and uh, uh making a couple of announcements which if you don't mind i will i will do and then i'll i'll proceed with the introductions uh so next week next wednesday uh, we will have a, a talk on uh, uh, democratizing finance uh, by uh, professor robert meister from the university of california at santa cruz professor meister will be talking about his new book and uh, we will send you uh, selections of the book to be to be read in advance. Uh, today, it's my enormous pleasure to introduce a uh, friend, colleague, uh, Gayatri Spivak, Professor Gayatri Spivak. Uh, Gayatri Spivak is uh, probably, I mean, we have all come to know of her as a member first and foremost of the subaltern um, studies collective uh, and as an author of uh, Can the Subaltern Speak? Um, I heard uh, Professor Spivak uh, at an online talk uh, some weeks ago and uh, she introduced herself as uh, somebody who uh, in the academy had been a student of Europe and the languages of Europe. Um, and I think she was speaking to a European audience and uh, I had a feeling she, she began uh, by telling them that uh, she was no stranger to who they are and who they were. So she's no stranger to the world. Um, Gayatri Spivak is a translator of Derrida, a scholar of Marx, and Derrida, and a translator of one of the texts uh, that we read for today, uh, Mahasweta Devi, and much more. Today's talk is uh, uh, titled Subalternity. We will have two discussions uh, after Professor Spivak's talk. Uh, the first discussant uh, uh, will be um, a miser third year student, third year doctoral student. And uh, the second discussant will be a, a research fellow at miser. I will introduce them when the time comes. Professor Spivak, please join us. Hi, um, I am very pleased to be here, but I also am a little uh, scared because I'm a humanities person. I'm not uh, scared for my own sake. I'm scared for the sake of the humanities. And you are an institute of social research. So I will try my best to make you feel the difference what, that can also be something that you can accommodate. At this point, before I start, first of all, I give a hello to Bob Meister, who will speak to you uh, next week, and or uh, the next speaker will be Bob Meister. 
I really like his work and he's also a friend. But then to go forward, I will say that when I was asked to give a, an inaugurating talk at the opening of the PhD in social science at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, in order to make clear what the humanities, they were taking a risk in um, inviting a humanities uh, teacher to actually inaugurate this. And I therefore gave them a title where I gave various cognitive positions. And the title was Study, Know, Learn, Hear, Listen, Do, question mark, Humanities for Social Studies. And I spoke, so study, know, learn, hear, listen, do, question mark. That was my, uh, my title, because I wanted to make clear that what happens in the humanities reading, it's this, um, uh, human, the research and knowledge, we accept through focused study, nourished by imagination is extremely important. But the next step, when you start learning from what you were attempting to know, is a very difficult one. And that's the mainstay of the humanities. When the, the object of knowledge, which is good, you have to do research, the object of knowledge takes on a kind of subject nature and teaches you so that you will yourself have to surrender your control. This is a very hard one. I, I'm not going to go further because I don't have that much time. Incidentally, what I'll do is on 45 minutes, I will close. And then in the discussion, I will bring in the, um, uh, the uh, material that I have prepared for our encounter. I think that would be the best use of time. So let me say then, and before I, uh, I start, I should say that um, I, have, I owe a great debt of gratitude to Surya Parekh, who is a friend, and you will be happy to learn that his dissertation was directed in writing on African enlightenment, and his dissertation was in fact directed by Angela Pivis. So he's a very appropriate person. Oh goodness, am I, is my internet failing? Um, very, very appropriate person. Does, does, does someone, Angelo Kakanade, want to speak? I'm happy if to be interrupted. No. no problem. I don't think so I was crossing the road and then um, I probably. Um, Javi, can you please mute? Can you please mute all of us, Javi? Yes, yeah, I think it was muted, but it turned itself on. Indefatigable PowerPoint maker, and he's the one who made the map, which is my background. And you will see in the map how much the place that we are going to speak about, a place called Chhattisgarh, which is uh, um, outlined in a, in a circle, how much it is in fact not a remote place um, uh, peopled by primitives. It's actually, you can see the, the map of India, but also Pakistan. I hope on this map you can see that, because I'm of course small for me. The uh, Pakistan, uh, a little bit of Afghanistan, China, Tibet, Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, and then you see Bangladesh on the other side, Myanmar, so that all of this, it's not like a remote place to which we cannot go. Chhattisgarh, it's called. And you will find the, um, you will find just below it a smaller kind of ellipse. That's the place. It's called Abujmar, and the name means Abujmar area, and the name means hills that cannot be understood. And Surya, I wonder if you could just show us the top topographical map for a minute. Surya, are you there? Hello? 
Yes, the topographical map. The topographical map. We are not in the topographical map, Surya. No, we didn't get it. The topographical map is what, ah, yeah. there you are. Okay, and as, if you go to the, could you click on the Naranpur area? There, there we go. You notice that there are, it's the one place where there are hills so that guerrilla warfare is possible and also hiding is possible. But in the actual name that in fact, by the way, the word tribal is used in Indian English and I can't offer an explanation now. It's not um, a racist word in Indian English. So th th that's where the name given by the tribals, most of them Gors, they is Abujmar, that is to say, these are hills that cannot be understood. And this place is described in one of the texts that we are studying, Arundhati Roy, but in Mahasweta's text, which is a kind of science fiction novella and not about any real place, she insists. There is, however, right in the middle, I believe it's on page 99, but I'm not completely sure, it could be 117, she actually drops that name Abu Jamar, just simply for people who know. So the people who know, know that this story is about Abu Jamar. Yes, it's actually page 110. So therefore, we need to keep in mind that that little hilly area is where we are focused. I think now we can go back to the Zoom background. Thank you, Surya. Okay, so, um, let me first offer, as I said I would to Mahmoud, a summary of Can the Subaltern Speak? Question mark, which was written uh, more than 30 years ago. Actually, it was first given in 1983. So, and I have described it as something that I came to through a class metropolitan identity crisis. I was in, in, in New York, and not in New York then, I forget where I was teaching, I think perhaps Emory in Atlanta. But uh, I was actually housed in Wesleyan University and metropolitan migrants like myself, you know, like um, a professor at a university, uh, middle class, uh, they often have this kind of an identity crisis. Now I feel this was a little stupid because I thought, Oh my, I'm Indian. How have I become an expert on French critical theory? And today I would say I should have done nothing about it because because I'm Indian, I've been, this is why Mahmoud was very good in noticing that I had described myself as a Europeanist to Europeans. I, I study you. Because I'm Indian, I've been actually declassified now, de-skilled. I'm constantly asked to talk about India. I am Indian, I'm an activist in India, but I certainly have not studied India. It's a huge subject. There are white folks who know more, know more about India through research than I do. I'm Indian and that's a, an activist in India. That's a very different ball game. So I had a kind of metropolitan identity crisis and a rediscovery of colonialism from a left, left US position. This was a new thing. This often happens at home also. They come to the United States and suddenly become leftists. And of course, I hadn't just come. A rediscovery of colonialism from a left US position. At that point, I wrote somewhat one-sided finger-pointing works as three women's texts and uh, can the subaltern speak? Question mark. But in 1984, for reasons I cannot now discuss, my institutional work and activist work came together and I realized that left and right were bound together, folded together, complicit, complicit, folded together. So therefore, I, they were, uh, since then, I have not been able to practice anything without acknowledging complicity and this has made my practice better. 
because the oppositional stance where I'm okay, you're bad, which is what can the subaltern speak somewhat was, it's, uh, that's really not in the case of practice, a very good practice. And here's the summary. It was about, because I wanted to take a distance from these big French theorists, I went to my family, to my grandmother's uh, sister, who at 17, because she was part of one of the small groups, um, uh, armed struggle against British imperialists, at 17 in 1926, she killed herself because she had been, she hanged herself. But she had been given an assassination detail as a lower middle class girl, but well educated because a schoolmaster's daughter, she could not bring herself to kill. And so according to the rule of uh, the Onushan and Shamiti, she had to kill herself. So this is whom I went to. I did not say in the essay that she was my grandmother's daughter because I knew that people would just love me because my grandmother's daughter had been in an armed struggle and I did not want that. What I encountered in published prose was resistance and hostility to the essay. Here's the summary. Bhubaneshwari Bhaduri, that was her name, Bhubaneshwari Bhaduri, gendered subaltern, and this was a new thing I, I did, gendered the subaltern. Later I learned that Gramsci in prison in his conversation, and that's what I'm doing now, in his conversation, epistolary conversation, with his sister-in-law and his wife, the Schucht sisters, who were both political uh, people, they, although they have been psychologized, Gramsci was discovering that gendered, Gramsci was discovering individual subalternization and gendered subalternization. There are many, many letters that have never been translated into English and now they have been. And that's a book that we're gonna bring out as soon as possible. So therefore, at that point, I didn't know about this. And so I gendered subalternity, okay. So Bhubaneshwari Bhaduri, quote, spoke with her body because before hanging herself, she waited to menstruate. She was only 17. Imagine the, the courage of doing that. Why? So that she could show resistance to the sati ideology. That is to say widow immolation on the pyre of the husband's corpse, the living woman in places which in India where women could inherit. It was connected with the economic situation. She spoke with her body, waiting to menstruate so that she could show resistance to the sati ideology of one woman belonging only to one man. In her case, to show it was not an illicit pregnancy. Two generations later, a highly educated woman, who's a great friend of mine still, Taradvi, highly educated woman in the family called her, you know, I came first class first in English in 1959. She came first class first in philosophy in 1957. She's written books. She was Jane Mohanty's student. So this is not exactly an idiot. So a highly educated woman in the family called her a scandal. Asked me, why are you working on her? On her? Because of illicit pregnancy. In other words, Bhubaneshwari's quote, speech act in extremis could not be completed. In the rhetoric of rage, I wrote, the subaltern cannot speak, the way in which you would say there is no justice when you really believe in justice. So I did not write an essay called the subaltern cannot talk. The subaltern, they do speak. So over the last 36 years, I have been working with subalterns as a result of moving from just this individual going to my own class in order to destroy subalternity into citizenship. Because when subaltern groups, um, Surya, you want to show that picture of Gramsci, the Gramsci uh, page. When subaltern groups, ungeneralizable according to Gramsci, um, speak, as they abundantly do, we do not have the infrastructure to complete their speech act. 
so that our work is to build this kind of infrastructure. And that's what I have, I have been doing for a good long time. The first part of the essay is a conversation between my between Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze. Okay, you see that, of course, all of you know, but I'll say it anyway, uh, Gramsci, when he was dragged into prison illegally, uh, he was uh, supposedly the prosecutor said, this mind must not be allowed to think for the next 20 years. Gramsci defeated them because in these little, you see the picture on the left-hand side, in these little cardboard notebooks in a small handwriting, he wrote, and this is the most important, uh, the most important notebook, notebook 25, 1934, two and a half years before his death. He was very, very sick. So they, spinal tuberculosis and all kinds of other things. This is the notebook where he writes about studying the subaltern, following it through from Roman slavery. And he writes, describes the subaltern as small as social groups, Gruppi sociali, as sociali, as you see. So, social groups, look at the printed title. Social groups at the margins of history. Ai margini della storia. Quite easy to understand. At the so, social groups at the margins of history. So this is something we will discuss later. But the first part of the essay is a conversation between Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze. My point there was that when these people, Deleuze and Foucault, quote, just talk, unquote, they forget the theoretical lessons that they have taught us. Another point was that when we are going to quote or teach, we might insert ourselves into the original language. We can't learn all the languages in the world. But when we are taking the responsibility of teaching, or at least citing, we owe it to ourselves. I've spoken elsewhere about how terrifyingly bad Gramsci's translations are. So I pointed out in that essay that when Marx uses a word for representation, he actually uses three words in German. And it makes a difference which one. Then in order to point out the importance of Bhuvaneshwari's resistance, I gave a careful reading, and remember I was untrained, so I really, I'm untrained in Indian matter. Fortunately, my uh, knowledge of the North, North Indian classical language is good enough, not very good, but good enough, so I could read the so-called scriptural texts. In order to point out the importance of Bhuvaneshwari's resistance, I gave a careful reading of the history of Sati the burning of widows with the corpse of the husband in areas of India where women could inherit. After that came the main part of the essay, concluding that the subaltern cannot speak, spoken in the rhetoric of rage. This was not the denial of voice to the subaltern, because I should perhaps not use the rhetoric of rage, because you need a humanities education to notice that. This was not the denial of voice to the subaltern, but the practical recognition that the elite does not have the infrastructure to complete their speech act, the speech acts of the subaltern, and the subsequent recognition that that was my life's work. So the, we are reading two texts today, and I'm, as I say, on 45 minutes, I will just stop. Both are about a middle-class journalist visiting tribals. As I said, the word tribal is in use in Indian English for reasons that I cannot go into here. If you look at the register of journalist killings and imprisonments around the world, you have to recognize that the figure of the journalist, and as we notice in New York today, the claim, the desire of the president to shut off the freedom of the press because it's a very scary thing. The figure of the journalist, and especially the risk-taking investigative journalist, is a heroic figure in our world. So to that extent, this is the, this is the story. They're going, they're two 
uh, investigative uh, journalists. Go, one of one of them is a kind of documentary, um, uh, an account of her own trip, although full of fictive uh, fictive grandeur. It's an iconic text, Arunati Roy's Walking with the Comrades, and the other is as a, a kind of science fiction. Okay, Arunati Roy's Walking with the Comrades, it, it shows how, this is for me important, how a subaltern population, and remember, small social groups on the margins of history. Can't discuss it now, but at least we remember as a formula can be brought to crisis by insertion into a discourse that they do not inhabit, Maoism. She enters this community, Arundhati Roy, in a somewhat cloak and dagger way. If you look at the beginning of her text, you will see that there is, um, there is this kind of a thing. The, um, I have password, Namaskar Guruji. The note said, a note was left on my threshold. The note said, writer should have camera, tikka, and coconut. Meter will have cap, Hindi Outlook magazine, and bananas. And he actually had eaten the bananas, so it wasn't a, much of a cloak uh, and dagger. Password, Namaskar Guruji. So this is a kind of cloak and dagger entry and the text is not only about the subalterns, but also about her role in reaction to them. This is an honest attempt to touch the other, to become one with the other, like that learning thing that I said. Remember, I said in the, in the title that I wrote to the, um, to the um, Coimbra folks, I, said, I gave the study, know, learn, here, listen, do, question mark. So this, she wants to get into the learning stage. So she, it's, it's an honest attempt to do that, but she remains master of the text. In the end, the controlling voice, even patronizing and romanticizing them in the already outraged uh, philanthropic middle class wins out, you know, in the, right at the end, she is talking about this it, which is, which is an alternative. See, so they, uh, so the comrade venue says, we are offering the world an alternative model. As a humanities teacher, my question here would be, what is the word for alternative that comrade venue is using? They're not speaking English. And so the idea of, giving there some kind of agency to the subaltern so that we know that this alternative model, this nice English phrase, actually might have carried resonances which this phrase cannot get. You know, I'll give you one example from my activist work. I try to learn how to teach because I'm so super educated from the metropolitan middle class, I'm muscle bound. I, and I, our caste has destroyed the minds of these people whom I teach now for 36 years. They, for millennia, colonialism is just yesterday. But so therefore, in order to teach them, I have to see, can I access them? And I share this, share this with them. So therefore, the methodology is shared. It's been a long time with the supervisors, not with the children. But so the, I say to them uh, that I want to teach them since an uh, intellectual labor, which they have been denied the right to for thousands of years. Now, intellectual labor, like alternative model, is a very nice English phrase. But in Bengali and in regional Bengali, it's much more powerful. It's mata khatano. Make it, it's mugotar khatano is making your body work. And mata khatano is making your head work. It's the same labor model. Now, if you don't know this, that phrase intellectual labor, that at least Vivek is teaching intellectual labor, and you would be correct, but that's not the language that carries the resonance. So alternative model, and then she goes on to say, this is, um, 
it it now now it becomes it it is not an alternative yet this idea of gram swaraj village um, self rule is a, a, an echo of a gandhi phrase gram swaraj with a gun there's too much hunger too much sickness here but it has certainly created the possibilities for an alternative not for the whole world this is a much revised text it came out in monthly review not for the whole world not for alaska or new delhi not even perhaps for the whole of chatisgarh that area but to it for itself now both mahasweta devi and a du bois passage that i will read they can claim globality through geological time but uh, not yet not yet so to continue with the arundhati roy passage um, it has laid the foundations for an alternative to its own annihilation it has defied history against the greatest odds it has forged a blueprint for its own survival and roy certainly has understood that it has to annihilate itself as subaltern in order to go into citizenship it needs help and imagination it's a great text but finally this is not a critique it's a warning to ourselves that this wins over it needs help and imagination it does not need war she writes but if war is all it gets it will fight back now the question is th this is not something that is going to produce a, a global um, a global uh, resistance to um, to uh, finance capital and uh, globalized financial globalization financialization of the globe etc this model has been something that we should certainly encourage but we shouldn't romanticize it in uh, this way so then uh, the um, uh, rather than go through other passages that i have here connected uh, collected that can wait because i now have just about 15 minutes i seem to have okay so how does literature supplement social research so because we are moving to uh, we are moving to we are moving to uh, literature now okay so what i want to do however for this um since i do say there is no chance of an all in resistance against global capital developing from arundhati rai's romanticized you know i i have napkins at home all embroidered by the zapatista because of course subcomandante marcos knew the kind of work that we all did together but that was also a wonderful thing but in the face of financialized capital this is not a resistance that we can take as a model but what one can do literature what literature can do is approach the global through an imagination of the geological i want to offer to you and you remember that this place is inhabited that little place with the mountains that i showed you with the hills that i showed you on the topographical it's the largest tribal group is the gonds g o n d s gonds if you want to um, make it pronounceable for those who are not local to the place but it's gonds right so therefore the place as arundhati roy says as a joke the british called it gondwana but here look at the imagination i want to go to du bois the book called the world and africa and this uh, the the thing the section is called the peopling of africa in the oxford edition page 52 i quote perhaps 300 million years ago africa was connected with south america india and australia the eastern side of this arch gave way forming the indian ocean and when the roof of the arch fell in there there appeared the great rift valley this enormous crack and du bois has a science fiction moment of imagining the martian as mahasweta imagines the pterodactyl this enormous crack the rift valley extending 6000 miles from the zambezi to ethiopia and syria is said to be of course it's also um, is in uganda uh, extending 6000 miles is said to be the only thing that martians can describe 
as they look earthward of a starry night. Gondwana land, writes Du Bois, the ancient united continent of Africa, South America, and Asia was divided into three parts by the new changes which caused the rift valleys. And now I read a passage from Mahasweta, page 99. The survey map of Pirtha block, a block, by the way, is the smallest unit of land managed by the state civil service. Below that is local self-government managed by the Sarpanch, literally the head of the five. So the survey map of Pirtha block, Mahasweta writes then, is like some extinct animal of Gondwana land. The beast has fallen on its face. The new era in the history of the world began, she writes, when at the end of the Mesozoic era, it broke off the main mass of Gondwana land. It is as if some prehistoric creature had fallen on its face then. Such are the survey lines of Pitha block. Now survey lines, these are extremely technical. This is how, in fact, Marx teaches us that primitive accumulation is the capitalization of land. You don't need factories yet. That it's going on everywhere. It's not only at the beginning, but that's originally or ursprünglich accumulation, the, uh, uh, the capitalization of land. And it begins with surveys. So therefore, Surveys, however, however, uh, however primitive, but surveys, you turn land into something, um, uh, an object of control and capitalization, the agribusiness, beginnings of. So this is, if you look at these two passages, I think you have a sense of connections between these great imaginers so that they're actually imagining a certain kind of unity. So what I will do now is summarize what I said, because I now have about, uh, about, I still have about 15 minutes. So, but let me summarize and then go begin to go through uh, uh, some pterodactyl passages. Okay, the, um, uh, what I said then to begin with was, uh, I offered a summary of I offered a summary of, um, of uh, Can the Subaltern Speak? And I tried to relate it to activist work. I gave an, uh, to me, important formula for how the humanities, I can't tell you, I'm teaching a course together with a very high level mathematician in the fall, mathematics and the humanities. And the way he's totally, he's a wonderful guy but he is a mathematician. The way he's totally putting me into a corner because he doesn't know what I want to teach. I know no mathematics. I know what I want to teach. This mindset, imaginative activism, so that the two sides can come together in confronting the problems of the globe, not just STEM. So therefore, this whole, that's something I gave in the summary and then I gave a description of Arundhati Roy saying, it's full of goodwill, it wants to touch the other, but the middle-class morally outraged uh, voice actually wins out in the end in patronizing and romanticization, and that that model cannot become a global model. And I said that globality was imagined geologically by Du Bois and Mahasweta, brought them together. Now, actually, rather than start reading what I would, um, uh, let's do the reading through the discussion period. What I would ask Surya to play for you is some things that I said at the end of a, of a webinar I gave two Europeans. They transform Europe is Vienna based. And at the end of the very long webinar, an hour and a half, somebody asked me a question about who is the subaltern in globality? Now, all questions with the is, excuse me for using language, is of course the ontophenomenological question. What today is the ontology of the subaltern? How does it appear phenomenologically? The ontophenomenological question. What 
is who is the subaltern in globality it was asked in a bit of a mocking way gc spivak who is the subaltern etc i could tell you a whole story about it but i don't think that's a part of our project today so surya do you want to play that answer subaltern i only use one sense which is uh, gramsci's notebook 25 because otherwise it becomes useless which is small social groups in other words not constituted into a class anymore that's in marx that's in the 18 primaire when he talks about why uh, they could not represent themselves geltent they couldn't um, they, they were incapable of making themselves geltent so machen that's that's marx in the thing but they so why because they are small social groups writes ramshi on the margins of history so therefore they are not generalizable therefore you cannot say that the folks that i work with are exactly comparable to the whatever the subaltern might be in brazil they're not primitive groups you know anthropology wants primitive groups these subalterns are also within they vote which uh, which is a very different thing and yet they're not generalizable so what you do and monica you actually mentioned it in one of your questions the older questions that so what you do subaltern is a position that this position because they they don't resemble you can't have the whole, whole world all subalterns come together no that's the problem with subalternity that we do not have the infrastructure to hear them they talk a lot i didn't try to think all subaltern cannot talk i wrote something subaltern cannot speak their speech act cannot be completed because they speak but we can't hear that's the work i've been doing for the last 36 years and not succeeding because there's thousands of years of subalternization so therefore i cannot tell you who is the subaltern because they are ungeneralizable what we need to do is to see that they become since they vote and democracy is for other people and yet they're poor as poor can be how can you teach that intuition to the children of the very poor i've been involved with this teaching now and for a very long time i don't succeed but it has to be done because it's the vote of the subaltern that creates a world inhabited and ruled by tyrants they in fact quite unlike in the in the past in gramsci's time they hold our destiny in their hands there is no way that i can tell you who is the subaltern in globality because that's the whole thing they're not generalizable subalternity must be destroyed again and again and again so that they can be they can claim citizenship but believe me they can't claim citizenship too easily because if they do they're punished and they take the punishment because they have been convinced by centuries persuaded by centuries of this kind of subalternization that they are that that their wretchedness is normal that they deserve to be where they are you try working with the caste system and you will see so therefore i that answer that question that's why i guess i wrote it in such a way that i couldn't read it that onto phenomenological question who is the subaltern in globality if it could be ans answered then they wouldn't be subalterns then they would be citizens it's a very hard task they're murdered for trying to claim their citizenship rights it's very hard for them to i could give you hundreds of examples because i work there so but at this is not the moment okay so you see this is my tone of voice with the europeans but at any rate i thought that you should see that i said exactly what i'm trying to tell you this is my position unless we get to subalternity in this way we are not going to be able to just kind of play around and anybody who says i am a subaltern should have their heads examined because uh, if you can utter that sentence you're not a subaltern especially to me with so much institutional power teaching at one of the world's so called god knows why topmost universities 
No, that ain't a subaltern. So therefore, the idea, you know, one more thing I'll say, because I still have five minutes. The, the person I work with, uh, with um, uh, in Nigeria, which I won't get into, but the reason why I chose, I mean, that group of uh, 10 people, and I, we've been working at this since um, nine years, for nine years now, trying to shift agency to South Africa, that's not worth describing. But the reason why I chose the person, I interview them, I go there, I hang in there, etc., all the time. But the reason why I chose this one, it's a small rural university where my friend Viola, Abiola Irele, who taught at Makerere, in fact. And uh, in fact, Mugi Bastiongo, my friend, also taught there. And he said about Viola, Abiola Irele, that the thing that they noticed was how sharply he was dressed, which is true. He really knew how to dress. But at any rate, Viola gave me an, gave me an entry. And so I interviewed, etc. The person I chose, Oluwasiun Akinfenwa, was because even in this rural university, small, only 10 years old, he had read up on me. So my second conversation with him, he was talking about subaltern. So I asked him a question. I said, are you a subaltern? And he said, no, I have been to university. I'm part of the elite. This understanding, you know, not from one of the great colonial universities like Makerere, Ibadan, my own university, University of Calcutta, you know, Ghana Legon, not one of those. Small rural university, but nonetheless, he knew he was not a subaltern. And I said, okay, this guy can work. So therefore, I just wanted to tell this story so that you realize that primitivization of the subaltern, claiming subalternity, you know, even my very dear friend, much smarter than I am, said anybody who suffers is a subaltern. Sorry, open Gramsci. So this is not something that can be claimed. And let me see, I have three more minutes to 45 minutes. And so let me just say that what we have to realize with the, uh, the no novella Pterodactyl, that's, that it is a literary representation. Literary representations are not blueprints that, but that tell you what to do. So in this case, the journalist Puran, in fact, does not, we, do, we are not sure that he doesn't, and that's part of the importance of the story, does not write his report, does not submit his report, no walking with the comrades for him, he leaves. And the story itself, you see, I'm just gonna say these things, you can't really, teach, this is a class I was told by Mahmoud, you can't teach a literary text by just saying, but I'll say, the text takes place, and this is something that the great critic Gérard Jeannette helped us to understand, the text takes place in a, in a space, of, in an alternative space. That's why the first part is all about Puran and his partner, whom he hasn't yet married, okay? So he actually moves away from that middle-class scene of gender movement, feminism, if you like, but feminism is not just middle-class, but in this text, otherwise there's no reason to give so much ab about Puran and Saraswati in the beginning we learn to take up the signals from a literary text, not just follow it like Lear, you read Lear, you will have to walk madly in the storms. No, we know that's not what it is. Macbeth, you have to kill. No, it, we know that's not what it is. But when it comes to third world literature, we forget that these are not blueprints. Mahasweta was herself also an activist. She really scared the police. That was her activism. So the thing is that in her text here, she places the story within a space of an alternative from a very serious gender claim, which is kept in the middle class um, uh, gender sensitive group because woman's place among the subalterns will be shown through 
those posters of families with one and a half children and so on. And it'll be completely different from what the so-called bourgeois feminist voice, even the left-leaning bourgeois feminist voice can accede to. I could also speak a great deal about this in terms of, I'm a feminist to the bone, but on the other hand, how can I approach this place where I teach with child marriage, with dowry, and respect the women? So that's another story. But now I'm right on 45 minutes. So we have started uh, ourselves into the pterodactyl being a literary representation. We follow the rhetorical signals. That's what we learn when we learn the humanities, to go from knowing to learning, hearing, listening, do, question mark. You don't succeed. This is for, that's why Marx said, the poetry of the future. The, the form, the only place where he talked about the content of a 19th century revolution. Said, the 19th century revolution will take its content from the poetry of the future. You work looking to a future, not wanting to succeed. And that's why you can't write grant proposals because you would be lying. Deliverables are not an issue there. So that's where I will bring myself to an end now. I really look forward to the discussions because I'm sure I'll learn something. And then you can ask me questions and I will perhaps, if those are your questions, give more of the reading of the novella. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you very much. Um, so we, will, we have two discussions and, and what I suggest is that uh, one option is for them to each of them to present. They have about 10 minutes each, 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can engage with what they have to say. And then we will follow up with uh, several rounds of questions. Uh, let's say three questions and then you respond. Three more, you respond like that. Like so, an oral exam. Sorry? Like an oral exam. Like an oral exam. I want to get at least a B minus. <laughs> you, unfortunately, you can't decide what you get. But, <laughs> but they, they, <laughs> I want. So the first discussant is uh, Solomon uh, Mengistab. Uh, Solomon Mengistab is a third year PhD student just writing his comprehensive exams. Uh, we'll go into the field next year. Solomon. Yes. <coughs> Please go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin with uh, thanking Professor Spivak for taking her time to speak to us here today. I would like also to thank Professor Mahmoud Mamdani for organizing not only this particular webinar, but the entire series of conversations. Um, I'm not going to summarize all the texts that have been given to us to read as part of this seminar because they are too long and I would assume that everybody has read them. What I'm going to do uh, is briefly go through the major points that have captured interest uh, while reading Professor Spivak's uh, in response, look back, looking forward, looking back and looking forward and part of, in part of uh, history chapter, which is also part of the book, Critic of Postcolonial Reason. Uh, Royce working with comrades and Davis no no novella, Petro Dikran, Puran, Sahai, and Pirtha. Now, after that, I will end with two questions to Professor Spivak as a way of extending the discussions. First, the first issue that captured my, my attention as I read through the texts is that the critic of postcolonialism through by using Foucault and Deleuze as the focal point of her critic. Uh, Professor Spivak, uh, critics post-structuralism, uh, one of the major points of critics is that the issue of epistemic violence. 
Professor Spivak points out that uh, while Foucault locates and overhauls uh, epistemic, uh, the epistemic overhaul without adequate engagement to uh, its related disqualification of set of non-European knowledge as inadequate renders Foucault's critique only partial, underlining that the duality of epistemic violence Spivak's right and I quote, until recently, the clearest available example of such epistemic violence was remotely orchestrated, far-flung and heterogeneous project to constitute the colonial subject as other. This project also, the asymmetrical obliteration of the trace of that other in its precarious subjectivity. Now, uh, this epistemic violence that constructed the colonial subject as the other uh, with inadequate or no knowledge of culture, history, subject is that the object of colonial civilization mission, which can take the examples of, we can take the examples of Sati here. The colonization see Sati as, uh, I mean, criminalizing or abolishing the practice of Sati as its social mission. It considered it as, as a social mission. Uh, I would like to, I, I'm going to go back to this point particularly later when I ask my question. The other point of critique of post-structuralism is that uh, the attempt to maintain the European subject or Europe as a subject. Now, Professor Spivak here under, underlines that Foucault and Deleuze assume the space of a subject, uh, which is uh, oblivious to the global division of power, labor, and the significance of the general theory of ideology, as if the subject has no geopolitical determination, or so they present it as undivided subject. This is probably because they are viewing uh, or imagining their experience as a universal, so their subjectivity more or less become a universal one. The other point here is uh, the issue of representation. Now, th th these two intellectuals in their claim that the oppressed know and can speak for themselves, uh, particularly Deleuze conflicts, argues Spivak, the two meanings of representation. One in its uh, political form to represent, to, to give a voice or to speak for. The other is in its art form to represent, to re uh, <coughs> present something, to reanalyze, that means. So uh, Spivak argues here that the, the subaltern, although they don't need the representation of the artistic form that to be analyzed, maybe they may not need that, but representation in sense of uh, making their heard voice, they need that from intellectuals. For her, it is the responsibility of the intellectuals to voice that uh, the, the concerns of the subaltern, which haven't been heard by, by power. The second point of interest that I have uh, in these readings was the, the, the delineation of the subaltern as a group. It, it, it is very interesting. Uh, Spivak says that uh, as a group, uh, the subaltern have no particular identity not national or ethnic identity, not class identity, but a group that are distinguished by difference. Only difference is their identity. Uh, she very carefully gives us this picture and I'm going to outline them one by one. In this delineation, the colonial or the post-colonial subaltern is neither equivalent to a larger group of oppressed or it's nor equivalent to group that have been colonized. First and foremost, the colonized subaltern subject is irretri <coughs> irretrievably heterogeneous. It refers to a group that has been deprived of the very opportunity of collectivity with persistent tenacity via manipulation of its agency. The colonial subaltern subjects are those that are located in the margins of circuit, the circuit marked by the colonial epistemic violence in, uh, underlines Spivak here. The subaltern group is not a national or an ethnic minority. It is not an oppressed class. It, is rather, it rather comprises those that are being denied access to the lines of communication with the circuits of citizenship and institutionality. 
For Spivat, the identity of two subaltern group is different. Uh, Savalta, uh, and Spivak also uh, goes further into the, the discussion of the significance of gender among the Savalta and within the Savalta and underlines that, and I quote here, if the context of colonial production, in the context of colonial production, the Savalta has no history and cannot speak, the Savalta as a female is even more deeply in the shadows. Spivak provides an excellent explication of what she means by the subaltern and more importantly, the subaltern women do not speak through two brilliant examples. Now, she's not saying that they, they, they are not able to speak. They do not have agency. What she's saying is that power and society is unable to hear their voices. So trying in, in, in Trying to illustrate these points, she gives us two brilliant examples. One is the example of the Sati, wherein the British colonial administration criminalizing Sati and the traditional patriarchy valorizing it. In between, the woman who is actually the subject of the Sati practice, her voice is lost. The other example that Spivak provides is the case of the Baduri society and the failure of society to understand the significance of her society and silence the meaning in her society, suicide. Uh, moving on, the third point that, uh, that was really interesting in reading this text was that the, the texts that have, the, the two texts that were taken out of the two, the two books, uh, the two chapters, they are dense theoretically and it's not easy to go through them and uh, actually capture the message that Professor Spivak is uh, trying to communicate. But, but the stories that she gave us, they are <laughs> very good examples of, uh, they are illustrations of how uh, the subaltern, what the, subaltern, the existence of the subaltern looks like, how the, their voice is almost in near, uh, uh, mute to the entire society. I mean, the journalists, the two journalists going in, doing that investigative narration is a perfect example of how these people almost exist uh, without any form of uh, visibility or audibility to the nation state, not only to the colonial nation state, but also to the Indian post-colonial, I mean, to the Indian post-colonial state. Uh, the, finally, the fourth point I would like to point out is Spivak's emphasis on the role of the intellectual and education in giving the subaltern the opportunity to, to be heard. Now, Spivak insists that the intellectual have a responsibility to sound the concerns of the subaltern because they have been denied of uh, meaningful voice uh, and she also emphasizes that education because is per per perhaps the most sustainable way of uh, taking the subaltern out of this uh, existence of marginality in the margins and have and having joined the circuits of citizenship and uh, an institutionality in the state that they are located in. Uh, I have two questions and I'll finalize my uh, presentation with the questions. One of the questions is related to the formation of the colonial subaltern subject. Now, this formation of the heterogeneous other, as it were through the colonial administration, mediated by translators who later develop into elites and uh, the continuity of this structure after the in the post-colonial through the through consumerism and the structure of global capitalism gives us a view of uh, the production of colonial subjects that are produced through direct rule production of which means law education administration where the colonial with the colonial power directly tries to administer them and considers uh, their administration as part of uh, its civilizing mission. 
Well, so what I'm, my question here is that uh, I'm wondering if we take the indirect tool perspective, wherein the colonial mission was not civilization, but in a sense to protect tradi tradition by compartmentalizing uh, people who are called the traditional societies or tribes and uh, administering them, uh, all the administering details were given to the local Jews. Uh, so if we see that if you through that, uh, can we have a different sense of what the colonial uh, subaltern subject would be? I'm just wondering because uh, when the colonial power direct relationship is removed from the tribes, the tribes are directly linked to their chiefs. So would that make a difference? My second question is uh, in the possibilities of mobility of the subaltern into the circuits of citizenship. So uh, I'm going to refer to uh, 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 Royce working with the comrades from the two to form my question here. In the story, the armed struggle resistance appear to have given the peasants voice or organizing themselves in organizing them and using that organization as a leverage to negotiate significant political and economic deals with the state and capitalist, its capitalist partners. It also appears that to, to have given women voice and space for political participation. These women who, are, who were the targets of rape uh, and gruesome sexual molestations in addition to the tortures and killings that the other villagers suffered by the police and the military forces. In also, also, but women who were forced to bear the burden of patriarchal oppression in their communities. In this uh, uh, armed resistance, they found their voice, the opportunity to participate for gender equality. But as it often happens, uh, revolutions, uh, especially left-oriented uh, revolutions in many places do that. They, they, give, they usually show genuine concern in addressing gender inequality and succeed in many, many times. But such progressive trajectories often regress as the revolutions come to an end. And it, <coughs> to address the, in, in trying to think, uh, moving the subaltern into the circuits of citizenship, giving them a voice through uh, social uh, movements or education or intellectuals uh, uh, engagement with the issue. Uh, how can we think of this regression? Because most of the time, even after they have been lifted out of that position, there, seem, there appears to be a, a continuous regression into the, the, that position of subalternity, invisibility and inaudibility. So what can be done to address this regression, not only to take them out once, but to keep them there as citizens? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That was very good. So another one is coming, right? Um, Gayatri, would you prefer to uh, respond to this now and then we get the second comment? I think it's probably better for time budgeting if we listen to both, don't you? What do okay. you think? No, no, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Because I so, tend to give long answers and I think one would have to wait for the second yeah, answer. Okay. So, very um, powerful, uh, powerful discussion. So, you know, let's go to the second one. So before I introduce uh, Dr. Okelo Guang, uh, I should just say that uh, even though the Institute is called Institute of Social Research, the doctoral program is an interdisciplinary program um, where one of the four pillars is uh, uh, cultural studies and literary studies. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Okelo Guang is uh, a professor in, uh, in literary studies, his main uh, preoccupation has been folklore, um, research fellow at McCrary Institute of Social Research and professor in the Department of Literature. Um, Dr. Okelogwa, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I'm clear. I thank yes, you, you very are. much, uh, Professor Mamdani and uh, Professor Spivak. 
I want to make two general comments, which probably speak more to myself, but also I do hope touch on the issues that have been raised and then pose it two questions too. But I do hope that the comments should also in themselves be a form of question. A first reading, Can the Subaltern Speak, was for me a very disturbing text. I didn't know how to get the head or tail of it, really. And, and then I was also coming into reading that text from a literary study in which I was already doing something called the study of oral literature, the study of um, the voices of men and women in their different locations, class, uh, gender, class, uh, sociality, religiosity, and so on. So I was like, but the subaltern is already speaking. So that was for me anyway. So I had to sort of try to get uh, under the skin of the notion of can the subaltern speak. And, and I, I cannot say that it really has finally um, uh, settled down with me, but it took a lot of the sort of reading myself out of my original position. Um, I guess uh, that, that was the task uh, that I had to face. Uh, the sort of like question comment that I would like to make has to do with uh, turning sort of away from uh, one set of critics, post-structuralist critics, back towards home, like a homecoming. And yet following your discussion, Professor Spivak, throughout both in the writing and your speaking, there's really no returning home because at every one point you, you, you move from your European studies as it were into going into uh, the study of the subaltern at the different layers from class down to underclass and you find that there are no straight answers. Different locations, different individuals and situations dif present different situations and so you also then invoke the, the notion of being a comparativist, which I also buy into once in a while. And so uh, my, my problem, or perhaps uh, also um, my comfort sort of is like comparativists uh, bring a lot of people together, even when they are not so common, we, which is also good, but also not very good. So the, 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 the niggling thing for me then is you've, you've undertaken quite a long journey then, uh, both intellectually, socially, and otherwise. And, and yet there is no end point. And, and therefore, as a scholar, as an activist, uh, are there no moments of frustration that you sort of get out of this? Or is it in itself also energizing because having a telos, having a teleological endpoint is like closing up on history. So I, I would like to hear a little bit more on that. And here in Makerere and uh, perhaps in the, on the East African scene, we experience on, on the literary scene quite a number of experiences um, and experiments, especially in the 1960s, there was a conference here in Makerere called the Makerere Conference of African Writers of the English Expression. Uh, that was in 1962. And then there was a Song of Lawino by Okotpa Bitek, great poem as far as I'm concerned, that came up in 1966 uh, with its long history itself also, oral and written history and its protagonist being a woman figure who sort of, for me, clumsily is a, is a subaltern, but uh, maybe not, um, but, but that's, that's, that's something for debate. But I guess I'm driving towards the debate that took place at the University College in Nairobi in 1968 towards the abolition of the English department, which seemed to have um, uh, shaken the place and shaken the region and shaken literary studies on the continent, which for me seems to resonate with a lot of things you're saying about the subaltern. 
But you see, I'm also coming from um, an English department that had called itself a literary department, perhaps only in dressing, because the content and the format and the behaviorism around it was still very much an English department behavior. And so you, so when I was reading your text, I found myself like, uh, am I reading T.S. Eliot's uh, The Love Song of J. Alfred Proofrock, which when I first met it uh, as a student in that 1983, as a young student here at Makerere, was a very puzzling text. This is not a poem. Because my understanding of poetry was very different. And then when I walked through it, I mean, somehow it now looks like a poem because I can remember these things about how him saying hints and guesses followed by hints and guesses. I can never quote a whole line, but there it is a powerful poem, the love song of Jail for Trufro, followed by all those that are, are poems of peace. So my humble question then is. Um, you undertook a journey or a series of a set of journeys. I wouldn't call it a series. From home, uh, home as we conventionally call it, into European studies, literary studies. And then you sort of see that the post-structuralist route was not taking you to that home. Then you come back home or would I want to call it backtrack? I hope I'm not being rude. And then you find that even back home, there's a lot to do. So uh, where is the satisfaction? Or are you one of these people who just believe in being annoyed all the time? Intellectually, that is. I'll leave it at that. OK. Well, this one is a little more aggressive because you are faculty. So <laughs> we'll see. That's what happens to us when we become faculty. We can actually hit on the same level, right? Students are a little more polite still. Okay, carry on. I enjoyed that. And very many, you'll be very surprised you and I have many things in common. Okay, so, um, Mahmoud, do I go now? Yes, you do, please. Okay, now, I'll begin with Solomon. Um, by the way, it was my great good fortune to meet Okotbitek in a, a post Bandung Institute where I also met Ngugi when he was uh, in 1966, when I was 24 and he was 28. And so I call him the horseman of the 60s because Paul Engel put everyone on horses because he's in Iowa, right? So international right program and his two legs were like this. And so uh, I call him and he has taken that as his self description. Uh, the horsemen of the 60s, I've known these people. And of course, it was my great good fortune to meet also others who are important in the history of, um, of literature in our time uh, and political thinking. Anyway, so let's go to Solomon. And um, I will say that, uh, let me begin. First of all, the very good point is that as revolutions end, the, now how long should I take for my responses? You decide. Anything up to half an hour. Anything up to half an hour. Okay, I got it. Okay, so the, um, this is an excellent point that as revolutions uh, end, we go back to, uh, to the um, old ways of thinking. Solomon, I will say through my experience that, it, and this I include uh, the United States, the large part of the world, we ourselves are not representative of how the world thinks. The largest part of the world, even in a benign way, when they're not doing anything really wrong, they're smiling. They think that rape culture and bribe culture is normal. Unfortunately, I mean, at home, they will pay a bribe that's, they say, oh, I call it a service charge. You know, a, a personal bribe, hey, salamis. So you just take this as, yeah, well, you know, that's how it is. So therefore, the idea of um, going back to that mindset, there are two answers here. One of them I will take from David Rodiger. David Rodiger, who has written a fine book on Du Bois. You see, I've been working on Du Bois now for some time. So 
uh, I know uh, Du Bois' um, uh, criticism, I hope some, and David Rodiger has a fantastic, fantastic concept called revolutionary time. And we all know, we who have been involved in uh, gesture politics and real politics, changing laws, uh, opposing resistance, etc. You know that I uh, come from West Bengal, so a very political family. Uh, so therefore, uh, we know that when we are in that, our energies, everybody becomes kind of much less selfish. Our um, energies are really give, moving towards solving these problems, etc. We are collectives, etc. But this does not last. This revolutionary time is an unusual thing. The normal time, when we can make these things last in normal times, and this is where I found that, um, that my other, um, uh, other uh, discussant, Okelo Ogwang, was um, uh, really very um, insightful there, that you cannot just say that this is going to have a teleology. It has nothing to do with, I don't like teleologies because I'm a post-structuralist. As an activist of any kind, and I must say that if you look at when Jürgen Hamas actually came in to work with Derrida after 9-11, uh, he changed his opinion of Derrida completely and called him, I quote, a philosopher of praxis. So this is a, you know, there is a certain kind of criticism by hearsay about so-called post-structuralism, which is an ugly phrase invented by myself. It's a wrong phrase. I will give money to anybody who can find a use before 1973, because I don't want to use that word, use uh, that phrase, and it's wrong anyway. So therefore, it's not because of that that I don't like teleologies. As an activist, as I said before, what has to happen is you have to, and this is complicit with European ideas as well. Just if the ideas are good, they think it all over the world, but Europe had the possibility of real publicity. So people, in fact, you know, mute in glorious Milton's, that's also uh, your, you know, uh, English poetry. So therefore, the idea that you teach in such a way, you see, you talked about education, that pedagogy is not income production, that they will go into the mainstream. That pedagogy, that's why it's so hard, because, you know, I say to these people, I'm your enemy. I come from the upper caste that has ruined you. Two generations, me and my parents, they were good. And even then, I don't know how good they were. But thousands of years of this kind of destruction of your societies can't be solved by two generations. One person like me can't change history. So therefore, the idea, you have to want this. And that is also a European idea. As I say, no, ideas don't have national adjectives except when they're bad. So uh, therefore, the idea that you have to, uh, to insert the children of the, I mean, these are poor people, you know, they have no toys, they play with broken bricks and their grandparents take them away at ages three and five from the school so that they can make some money looking after other people's goats. I'm not talking about people who come and sit on uh, in chairs. So therefore, these people, but they vote, therefore I have to somehow think of a pedagogy which would insert the intuitions of democracy into, you know, like habit. That's how you teach children. Adult education doesn't get there. The pedagogy of the oppressed doesn't get there. It does do what you said, Solomon, that, you know, once it's over, it's over. They become sub-oppressors. But if you can make, make very small children, it's like writing on wet cement. It's hard as hell, but you have to earn some kind of, I mean, and it's not like Montessori, oh, you're so nice. And that's, they lead very traumatic lives. You don't, and when the ruling class comes in, they're all, oh, how nice you are. They know that this means nothing. So the children certainly know. So therefore, the idea of inserting the children of the largest sector of the electorate 
into the intuitions of democracy and making them habitual, that is so difficult. It's not like giving them computers and so on. And I say, unfortunately, that this is not going to necessarily give you jobs. You've got to think about, you know, so that's why Fano and Gramsci both asked, can liberal education only lead to the oligarchy that we know? So therefore, when you say education, it's not like that bullshit word education that everybody now says, oh, education is too uh, very good. It, is, it doesn't resemble education. And so, and I also think that, so this is what, it, when you say what is to be done, very, very long term. See, I was just interviewed by a parliamentarian from Armenia, and he also asked me a mocking question about you know, the way I've described this education, he read something, but he doesn't realize that I don't write about this work because if I try to, I've not written a book about it, it's not a secret, but if I try to transcode it for academics like yourselves, my focus on desperately sinking and swimming, trying to learn from those who cannot actually teach because they're completely ill-educated or illiterate, trying to learn, that's what I was talking about with that title, study, know, learn, hear, listen, do, question mark, trying to learn how to actually deal with that kind of destroyed, destroyed by us, mind machines, so that it can go in that direction. That's not, that's, if, if I want to write for an academic audience, my focus will be gone. So I haven't, oh, in 36 years, I haven't written a book and I don't have a method. I don't have a method. I'm still, and I don't want to have a method. So therefore, when you say the role of the intellectual is to give them a voice, you're not correct. It, it's, the, and citizenship is not necessarily good. Haven't you met horrifying citizens? Citizenship is just the generalizability. There are many different kinds of projects. So I, now I will say something to, uh, to Okelo Ogwang that it's not, with me, it's not really a wanting to go home, etc. My only passport is Indian. I'm not a, a dual citizen of America, etc. because if I were, I would not be able to go into these places. They are not, uh, foreigners are not welcome there because they, you know, they're, they're suspicious of, uh, nobody, I haven't seen, just as when I'm in Ghana, the, for my Du Bois book, I don't see another white person. I'm on the compound of, of uh, the, the so-called Du Bois Institute. I live in that little guest house. So this idea that I have some, I don't particularly um, like the Republic of India. Both my country, have, I love it, which is a very different thing. I can't help it. But you don't base politics on this kind of, thing that you can't do anything with. And to that extent, I also love the United States because also I detest the United States and I detest what's happening in the Republic of India. So therefore, because I've had thousands of American students, I've taught full time at a university for 54 years. I became a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Iowa, 1965. I don't disclaim that. And although I don't, can't vote in the United States and I have no civil rights, nonetheless, since I've tried to teach thousands of students in this short um, thing, the difference between right and wrong, that's not correct, but you know, literally stuff, I feel that I've voted many times. So therefore, the idea that I have some kind of silly wanting to go home is not correct. I don't own anything in India. I have no property. I have no bank account. I don't own anything. I own a, an, a, an a apartment where I'm sitting now, uh, above uh, the above the line that cuts off Harlem from the. Not because I'm uh, politically correct, but because it costs less. Nice apartment costs less, so the, it's true. So I own one apartment, 1,600 square feet, quite big, but not as big as Mahmoud's. But uh, so the therefore that's all I have two um, credit cards. I don't have a credit card at home. I, and I have, I have to take out money from the ATM uh, rupees. And sometimes they block it because they think it must be fraud. So I can't pay the salaries of my teachers. So therefore, 
the idea that I'm doing this because I'm nostalgic about India, that's an insult to me. I ain't like that. I don't have a home. I have two homes. I'm a New Yorker and I'm also a Baligandhi, not a Calcuttan. I'm from Baligand. That's a very special place in Calcutta. So therefore, it, if someone asked me, a very good friend, where do you feel you belong? I said, I don't care. It's a narcissistic question. I don't know who belongs anywhere. But since you're asking, Manjari, she's dead now. In fact, I have a picture of her on my desk right here. Since you're asking, let me think. And I said, well, you know, uh, New York is not America. And I'm certainly a New Yorker. I love New York. And uh, it's, uh, and since you're asking, I think I really feel I'm at home in Baligand, not in Calcutta. I have no con intellectual connections in Calcutta until recently. So I would say that the role of the intellectual, you've got it wrong, uh, Solomon. It's not to give voice to anyone. It's really to efface one's, I, as I said, you see what you've read is so old and I move along, I make mistakes. And that's another thing that I would want to say to Okelo okay, Ogwang that uh, yes, my, it's not frustration, but I think what I am, slowly learning, I didn't in the beginnings, but I develop as I'm trying to, uh, trying to go forward, to learn from mistakes. It's a positive thing to be able to make mistakes that are, uh, and share them with your, uh, with your students. I was wrong and uh, to learn from them. This is, and try to learn and then see that you haven't quite learned. That's in fact, the intellectual's role. And if you go to Gramsci, very badly translated, so you will find this, find this uh, uh, in English misrepresented. He says that the relationship of the new intellectual, who's a permanent persuader, you saw that persuasive voice when I was speaking to the Europeans, so angry, but the permanent persuasion, the role of the new intellectual is the with the subaltern is one of master and disciple and who is the disciple and who is the master the disciple is the intellectual and the master is in the english it's translated as environment but the social conditions within which the subaltern is existing without accessing uh, accessing um accessing um, accessing citizenship. The, so it, it's a very different thing from intellectual having the, the duty to give voice. Who the hell am I to give voice to anyone? No, the structure of citizenship is a structure. It's in place. And whereas subalternity is not generalizable, broadly speaking, citizenship although it's gone to hell. I mean, in my country, the worst thing, and also in the United States, the worst thing now is withholding of citizenship. See, so therefore, that why do people care? Why do states care? Because it's a very important tool still, because there is no social contract in globality. So this is, I mean, the social contract has gone to hell, no redistribution, no nothing, but still that's what remains. It's got nothing to do with me giving voice to anyone. The intellectual, in fact, do you think policymakers listen to intellectuals anymore? The answer, a resounding answer is no. So therefore, please rethink. And what you were quoting, the space of difference thing, you were actually, I don't, I'm not interested in the colonial um, uh, subject and so on and so forth. I was at that point um, very, uh, much under the influence of Ranajit Guha. I really respect him greatly. I think he's a brilliant historian. He's my friend. I visit him whenever I'm in Vienna. He's in his 90s. I, so, but this has nothing to do with my respect for his astuteness as a brilliant historian. But because, because I was reading that introduction to the subaltern studies. I was in fact, that space of difference, that isn't something that I stuck with. 
but as I said before, can the subaltern speak? And uh, Okello, let me tell you that the you say that it was something that you felt that what is this really an essay? I because it was very hard for me, very hard for me, to go away from these French masters. I was in the politics of the Ecole Normale Supérieure at uh, 45 Rue Dume. Foucault described me as a petite dérigiste, and so he didn't come to my damn lecture at Montreal. So I was scared to death of these people. I mean, I was at Vincennes, Deleuze really hitting someone hard because by mistake, he said, vous to Deleuze rather than tu, you see. So these folks were real and I was very scared. And so, and I was going to my family. So I couldn't, I had a real writer's block. I couldn't write anymore. I thought it was too long. I thought it was too complicated. I thought it couldn't be understood. I sent it to my two editors, Gary Nelson and Larry Nelson, and said to the editors, help me cut this, help me simplify this. And they published it as it was. And I have never heard the end of, oh, is this an essay? Well, you know, that is, but you did say that, you know, I said to you, let us go then, you and I, you know, because you did say that like that poem, you felt, eh, well, and thank you for that because it's not something, that's why I said to uh, Mahmoud, in fact, they don't have to read it, it's too hard to understand. And uh, you know, I also, let me say to you that I, I haven't hit half an hour yet. Uh, let me say to you that I don't just go there and wag my tail to be home. I drop my luggage in Calcutta and I buzz off the next day at 6.45 on a train. At the train station waits the person because I go way into the interior, which I can't in Africa because I don't know languages, but I do as much as I can with these, this group at the Nigerian University. So, and also groups in Ghana. But the thing is what I do is then someone waits for me with a motorbike and a helmet. I get on the back of the motorbike because there's no other way that I can go so far into the interior. And then we go into the interior and I go and uh, start teaching immediately that afternoon because there isn't, I don't want to take them away from their other work because I'm not an NGO. There's no place to stay, no nothing. So, you know, I have to hang in with them or in the so-called schoolhouse. So therefore, this is not a kind of go and be, enjoy yourself. I, I'm never in Calcutta, but I also give lectures in Bengali to the mechanical Marxists, huge lectures which are published as books in Bengali. They are not like talking to the subaltern. I talk to the, to the people for whom I have a lot of contempt, my own class, you know, my own class. And so these lectures are published. If you learn the language, you'll read them and you'll see, I called once from my own experience teaching to a Bengali audience, a thousand people in the room, many people come because I'm so hard hitting. No, no. I told them that the uh, liquid excrement of teaching is going out of primary school teaching and rural teaching is going out non-stop through the anus of the state. This is a sentence in Bengali that I uttered to them. So to an extent, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of that voice also now. I didn't before. And then finally I'll say about can the subaltern speak because it's so hard, I go to the second level universities because the elite universities, you know, like Makerere, like my University of Calcutta, or Jane, we are more or less the same. Ghana, Leon, we are more or less the same. It's not a problem. But in, uh, when, if you go to the second level colleges and universities, since I'm an English teacher, I like to see how English is being taught. I have never stopped being an English teacher. And let me say that in the, at, in Calcutta, I didn't just come to the, the United States to become an English teacher. You know why I came to the United States? Because I had been, I was 17 when I graduated college. English honors, I was studying English in Calcutta, okay? So therefore it's not like I came to the United States suddenly to do Europe. So in that particular situation, you, the, what I had done, I became an editor of a journal. And in that um, journal, 
I wrote a scathing critique of the university. And I had no father. I was supporting myself and my mother. And so therefore, can you hear me? Yes, we can, but okay. we can't see you. Yeah. Because I'm losing my Zoom. So the, uh, the thing is, and therefore, and I, somebody asked me at an interview recently, what did you write? And I looked in Bengali, of course, I looked at it. I was pretty bold, hard hitting critique of the university. Okay, and so one of my well-wishing um, professors said, there's no way you're gonna get a first class in your MA. And at that time, since, as I say, I was supporting myself, the, the idea of going to, I mean, the only way that you could go abroad, if you were in the humanities, you know, the five-year plans, was if you had enough money to pay for yourself. I certainly didn't. And so therefore I thought I gotta leave because I won't, and the only way you could get a visa or a passport was if you got a first class. I had managed to get a first class in my BA. And if I was not gonna get a first class in my MA, so the, I, I had a leave. I had no intention of leaving. I was a student at the university, very politically active, marching in the, on the streets, et cetera, et cetera, doing electoral education under Amran Dattu, et cetera. But I didn't want to be imprisoned there because of these jerks who were teaching at the university and I had criticized them. So therefore, I borrowed money on a life mortgage because I didn't know what a collateral was from a person whom I didn't know whose name I had heard. And with $18 in my pocket, knowing nobody in the United States, I didn't know you tipped cabs. And a one-way ticket to Ithaca, New York, I phoned Cornell from, I got a trunk call. I phoned them. I knew Harvard, Yale, Cornell. I didn't know anything else. And I thought Harvard, Yale would be too good for me. So I phoned Cornell from the post office, Baliganj post office. And I said, I'm a very good student. I don't need financial aid. Please admit me. Later, my teachers would laugh. They would say we had never since or before admitted someone on a phone call. I was 18 years old. So to think that I went to the United States to learn Europe, it's an insult to me. I don't tell these stories because people would love me. I don't want love either. But believe me, all of this is well documented. Many Bengali interviews, and I can offer you that Bengali essay, the editorial, any day you like. But so therefore, I think that insulting image of an Indian wanting to come to the United, and I never became a citizen. It didn't occur to me. And, and I, if I had children, I would probably be acting differently, but I realized that too. But so therefore, I mean, it's, it's now my field work not to be a citizen. You can own property, you can teach at a very, very fantastic school, you can have credit cards, you can have bank accounts, you can even have a foundation, as I do. It's a small foundation uh, with the money from my Kyoto Prize, which is for the future, uh, not big enough to pay anything right now. But it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is your citizenship. My mother had, for reasons that I can't go into now, because protecting my brother's children, etc., she had a U.S. citizenship, okay? Small Bengali lady, feisty. She and I would go together. I would take her when I was invited to Europe. And, you know, she would go through, you know, passport. And with my passport, because U.S. passport. And with my passport, you know, they would look at my face. Speak English, they would look, family. And when they would say family, I would say, yes, sitting right there. Get me through. That's my family in your country. Get me through. So you see, you have to realize that I do not write about these things because I think it would be a way of getting popularity, which I despise. Let me be, I, I, and I remain interested in theory. That's what I write about. I like theorizing. I teach my students not to apply theory, but think of theorizing as a practice so that it gets internalized, part of it be haunted by these people. So I have not turned my back on theory. So therefore, it's the, in fact, there are lots of theoretical things in these texts, which one can, one can uh, test out in the work that one is doing. You know, after teaching, I sit down, I have a helper whom I'm training to be, you know, like me. He's an English teacher at Shantipur College, which is a local college um, in, in a rural uh, college. Very, very smart. That's another story. 
So therefore, the, uh, going back to Solomon, I was under the influence of Ramadhi Guha. I'm not in, like I said to Mahmoud, uh, you know, colonialism was only yesterday. I'm not talking, and what I was very struck by when I looked at that essay again, there is no mention of caste. You cannot study the Indian subaltern without looking at caste oppression. Unfortunately, you, the class and caste are tied together in many different ways. But in that introduction by Ranadit Guha, there is no mention of caste. I adore him. It's not a question of liking or not liking. But so therefore, don't hold me down to that, Solomon, that space of difference. That ain't what I went on to. Space of difference, what? I see them all the time. I have two teaching jobs. One, Columbia, which pays me a salary. The other, where I repay ancestral debts. They are the same. They are the, I teach, the, I go to India five to nine times, stay a short time, stay with them, try to teach as best I can, fail. But I fail in, at Columbia also, because you think it's easy to teach an activist global classroom that you folks are touched by the superpower and the first right is the right to refuse. That the first right that the people you're trying to help with an interpreter is the right to refuse. So, and therefore, this is something, Solomon, I'm responding to both of you, I have five more minutes. The, um, that's something, and this uh, feminism, the, uh, the, it was not the British who wanted to make them uh, criminalize it. Bentinck was very strongly impressed by Ram, Raja Ram Mohan Rai, who was very interested in criminalizing Sati. And it was an unquestioned good, unquestioned good. Uh, what I was interested in was, and you, you pointed at it, and uh, that's very good, was that the, um, the subjects, the satis were not subalterns and the satis were not resisting. I mean, they were talking, they didn't, some of them didn't like it, but some did. You see a recent, a recent sati in India, Roop Kaur. Roop Kaur's mother was smiling as the feminists went in to intervene because her daughter burnt alive on the, husband's corpse spire had found an appropriate end. Okay, so let's not get this wrong there. W women good, B British men bad. It wasn't like that. So therefore, we are complicit. So that's the, um, and then uh, the two texts are opposed for me. Orundhati Roy, as I tried to say, does take in um, a thing, thing, this kind of violence is something that these uh, tribals can be incited to because they have forever been cannon fodder. They have not been people of the kind of democratic judgment that I was thinking of. You can certainly negotiate with a bad state. Chhattisgarh is not the most important state in India. And he says it, she says it affects us all. Sitting in West Bengal, it doesn't affect me. So the, it's a loose federation India is. So what's happening to India now is that the colonial subject idea, which was long ago, it's gone because what Lenin called the progressive bourgeoisie, I have one more minute, progressive bourgeoisie brought in uh, so-called independence, negotiated independence. Gandhi was a negotiator. So the, uh, the, all that fighting and uh, so on, they were just uh, legally punished, Khudiram, et cetera, et cetera. I could go into real detail here because this is my childhood. But what happened was that these characters, Nehru, Gandhi, etc., they didn't really know India. We, you know, one was a British uh, uh, trained barrister. He knew his little place. And Nehru was, of course, completely Fabian. So they discovered India in an Orientalist way. And in Gandhi's case, the day before he uh, did, uh, spoke about Ahimsa Rowlett, there is a very long published letter to C.S. Andrews where he says, I didn't find anything about nonviolence in anything Hindu that I read, a letter. So that the, the, this is an Orientalist India. And now slowly in, in globality, the old theocratic India is coming back. The deep seated 
um, a feeling of resentment against uh, the loose federalism wonderful of the Mughals. It's and the caste system consolidated itself in many ways in order to uh, face that. And that kind of thing, at least we had lived with the conflictual coexistence in the Muslim. But once it's politically mobilized, I know, I saw the Hindu Muslim riots when I was very, very, when I was a child. That doesn't go away. So therefore, the idea that I would be interested in the colonial subject counts for zero now. We have the, the colonial subject is like the intellectuals who are not heard. We are shot to death in West Bengal. It's not that easy. But, you know, uh, my friend Gauri Lankesh, leftist intellectual, not only was shot to death, but her corpse was shown. So therefore, I'm not interested in the colonial subaltern. That was, that was subaltern studies. I think they did good work. And I do not study the subaltern at all. As I was trying to say, there's no book. I try to learn what I can. And in fact, many political theoretical books I find a bit boring because the author is making generalizations without having actually hung out with people who form the largest sector of the electorate. Misunderstanding of democracy. I mentioned Ramachandra Goa, Goa here. He's a good guy, but he doesn't know his, his whatchamacallits. So one sentence and then I go. I, general questions. See the, um, what else should I say to you? Yes, oral history. You see oral, uh, studying oral literature. Oral literature is not necessarily the opposite of, um, of uh, written literature. This is a, um, what they write on, and this I talk about a lot um, in um, Africa with Biola, it was possible. It's kind of a, a half a joke, pre-scientific digitalism, writing on memory. So that rather than crude writing that the missionaries brought in, put languages in a box, give them writing, give them a name, etc., etc. They were established lingua francas. These unsystematized languages are survival languages. I'm not romanticizing. I don't think they're good necessarily or bad. But and they're not just spoken by these communities, they're spoken by politicians when they go into campaigns so that there's ethnic violence before elections and so on. They're spoken also by people like Henry Chakawa, who first told me about this, who in, in fact does think that Mugi was not particularly um, uh, correct in taking away the Department of English because the English department exists. Uh, but Henry Chakawa, who's a publisher and a first year student of Mugi's, the, he calls himself my brother, so really close. He took me to his, uh, to his village house, etc. So he uh, was the one who first told me as he was at the University of Nairobi, I'm lecturing and then after, after that I'm eating and he's talking to two, uh, two uh, other PhDs. They're all speaking English like me. So he turns to me and he says, hey, I'm not speaking um, in Swahili, you know. I'm speaking in Kimaragoli, which is my, uh, my unsystematized mother tongue. So the, we share it. So it's not just those little communities. And so now, people at the top of linguistics are trying to study because it's not just native. There's multilinguality, dialectal continu continuity goes down all the way the Eastern coast so that uh, Africans can say, we understand languages we don't know and people mock them. But I know what that sentence means. And so therefore they like Claire Bowen at Yale, Stephen Bird in Northern Australia, they are trying to learn by accessing, which Arundhati Roy can't quite do, by accessing them, trying to learn how these languages are taught, digitizing, because digitally it's becoming not a database, but something else. It's too much of a problem. And we are involved in that work. Why? Because the development lobby, which is the worst kind of exploitation, this is what activism means for me. I don't write a book about this because what do I know? Nothing. The development lobby is for everybody else is interested in preserving languages, which doesn't do much good for the ones who are speaking the language. That's fine. They should be preserved. But the development lobby thinks 
the world's wealth of languages is an inconvenience. So we are trying to, most <clears throat> development workers are crooks. This last sentence, <laughs> most development workers are crooks, but there are some good. I always feel there are some good. We are trying, but with the help of these top level linguists, it's an impossible project. Talk about telos, development policy, who listen? We are trying, once again, Solomon, long term, we are trying to give some kind of interest in learning from those uh, who are being developed. And now we can't because of the lockdown. So these are some of the things that make me feel that oral history, testimony, and so on and so forth does not undermine, uh, undermine this argument that I'm making. And I've written a great deal about this exchange with John Beverly. So it's published work about 10 years old. I, if you want to hear my voice, you will see it there. And that's, uh, and for Solomon, if you want to see how this long-term education should be kept up, why we solve short-term problems immediately, read a piece that I wrote. There are mistakes in there, but it's called What is to be done, you know, a joke, uh, Lenin's uh, title, that I wrote at the request of uh, the um, uh, Occupy Wall Street, and it's published in their journal called Tidal, okay? Tidal. And last but not least, I did not go in there to help anyone. I never go anywhere to do anything unless I'm asked. I started those schools after much resistance because I was asked by a middle-class activist in Purulia, Prashant Rukhi, in 1983, please to subsidize and open four schools. So that's it for now. Let's have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gayatri. Um, so just, uh, uh, I, I have a, a set of names. I have six names here and enough for two rounds, but uh, I'm going to just invite those who want to ask a question. Uh, just put down your name and your institutional affiliation on chat, and then I will recognize you. And if it's a student or a uh, faculty, that's um, all. I will, I will, yeah. Student or faculty, yes. Um, or observer, I don't know. Um, so the, the first three, the first round, uh, three people I have here, uh, Sara Sari, uh, Dr. Sara Sari, uh, who is the head of the uh, School of Women and Gender Studies at Makerere University. Uh, the second is Professor Isa Shivji from uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, and the third is a student at Miser, David Ngendo. Um, Sarah, may we begin? Yes, good evening, Prof and everyone. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot, Professor Spivak, for enabling me to learn more about subalternity. The farthest I had gone was with regard to Patas Chatterjee's work on uh, the politics of the governed. My question is, can, is subalternity contextual? Can one be a subaltern in one context and not in another? And when we talk about sub, the possibility of escaping subalternity, who determines, who gives, the, who gives us the mandate to decide who are subalterns and who are not? And don't we risk being accused of othering other groups of people who have no, who may not have labeled themselves as subalterns, but we label them as such. So it is around that Con context and the possibility of othering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Shevji. Yeah, um, I didn't have a very short comment. You partly answered in your uh, in your uh, response to the discussions. My question was that <clears throat> th this thing that you describe as a claiming citizenship by the subalterns, the first time around, I got the impression that somehow you were, uh, 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 you were conveying the idea that citizenship is somehow hierarchy is better than subalternity. But I think in your in your in your in your answer to this to, to, to the discussions before the period, because for me, some if it, you're right, you say rightly, there's on the margins 
not only of history, but also of the state. Yeah. And with every citizenship, you become the subject of the state, swearing loyalty to the state. Okay. And, and this is another form of oppression, actually. Maybe, maybe you join the mainstream of resistance, maybe. So maybe I would like to I'd like you to say something more about that, the, 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 the change or the movement from subalternity to citizenship. Thank you, David. Gendo? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, uh, thank you so very much, uh, uh, Gayatri, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, I was struck by this road uh, from subalternity to citizenship and following uh, Professor Sivji's comments or question, I, I want to know from you whether is there, a, is there one way to linking the two or more than one way? And, and, and if there is one way, is, is that road or that way a straight or, or senior? Is it senior? But most interestingly, I, I want to hear from you whether who is to travel the road uh, from subalternity to citizenship? Is it the citizen to travel the road to subalternity or the subaltern to travel the road to citizenship? Thank you. Okay. Let now, shall I try to give my answers, Mahmoud? Yes, please. Okay, Sarah. The, um, my, uh, 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 Surya, perhaps I could show those photographs. Those photographs? Yes. Okay. See, where, the, where what photograph is this? Okay. See, subalternity, you see, these are pictures, hold it there. These are pictures that I took uh, out of my uh, um, car window, traveling from Ilorin to Lagos, because I have to, I drive uh, there because I have too much luggage for uh, the um, uh, planes. And so I don't drive, I'm driven, and Viola and I have been driven quite often together. So when you ask, is sub subalternity is not recognizable by looking. So it, it is certainly contextual, what you ask. And sub, the, in fact, one of the things that uh, I was told in the con conference call for, for papers uh, at Molana Abul Kalam Azad uh, Institute some years ago on marginalization, what, the, the, in the concept uh, d description in the call of papers, they said, we do not want speakers who are marginalized where they live, like in the United States, and are dominant in India. And I said, thank you for understanding that I'm not one of them, although I am, of course, you know, I am somewhat, I mean, if people don't know uh, that I teach at Columbia, I'm only an old lady of color, I'm treated like an infant or an idiot, but you would be surprised, but Surya knows. But uh, uh, the thing is that, uh, so yes, it is contextual. It's a taxonomy, global as a concept metaphor, generalizable, subalternity, you know, like uh, it's a d distance from citizenship, it's distance from lines of communication. You can generalize those abstractions, but ungeneralizable in the local. They cannot be recognized by looking. So, you know, when I look at this, I don't think this is with all these tires and so on and so forth. I don't think this, I'm looking at subalternity, but how do I know? I would have to, as a, an activist, imaginative activism, the, that other kind of education, that's the only way to get into subalternity for me. Let's go to the next one. Okay, now this, there's a child standing between the two huts, okay, wearing a hat. Uh, it, it, that child, Surya is pointing, that child is the candidate for an education that inserts it into the intuitions of democracy, the work that I do in India. It is one unit in the largest sector of the electorate contributing to democracy understood arithmetically as body count. Go to the next one. It's just taken from my window. Okay, on the left is a latrine in Nigeria, and on the right, a similar latrine with one tin door stolen by the chief guy who drives my motorcycle, Shuni Lohar, a jerk. Okay, so you see, I don't romanticize the subaltern. The similarity is not a sign 
for comparability of subaltern. They look more or less the same. That one's a little crooked, but this, you cannot tell by looking. So carry on. Generally, the fully dressed sitting people are waiting for a pre-planned ride. Is the person lying down inside the structure guarding these objects for himself, for someone else, or simply resting? Upon, being er upon earning the right through language, this can't be asked through an interpreter. That, that's when I will begin to move in. But this is, a, my car is moving. Okay, so then let's go to the next one. I think there's just one more. What happened? Yes, this is unreadable when viewed for subalternity. I would have to hang out with the people who live in these huts, as I do in Bengal, where I can speak the language. Hard to access the subaltern with an interpreter. Go. A truck stop is undoubtedly a truck stop. It's by a, by a highway. There's food in those things with newspapers and whatever. What food and gasoline over there. Okay, carry on. Not subaltern, in my understanding. This is not a subaltern establishment. The main house, garage, and servants' quarters. The garage is just where the thing is, where the car is. Again, the woman is waiting for a ride. And so this by the highway. So that, in fact, as I said, in order for me to get to my schools, I have to go way into the interior where I've not seen an NGO in these 36 years. It's way below the NGO radar. And that I can't do here, by the highway. That's, that's a very different situation. On the other hand, as you say, Sara, some of uh, contextually, if even I am subalternized, there could be subalternity here. There's no more, right, Surya? No, no. So the, um, as for the risk of othering, what's the risk? I mean, you know, if you want, and this is really also an answer to Okello Ogwan, je et un autre, who said that? French poet, gun runner. So what's the whole thing about othering? Uh, do you think you will stop othering by not helping the subaltern? I don't care. It's very narcissistic for me to think, oh, oh, oh. Am I, just, I tell them all the time. I'm an upper caste uh, Hindu. I harmed you. So yes, of course, it, knowledge is othering. You can't, I mean, this uh, idea of you can have to affirmatively sabotage Hegel here. That's my idea, by the way, not just following, but since we have, they had the leisure of the theory class, the European Enlightenment moved slow because the distance from the emergence of capital to actually getting where they are now, many centuries. So they had the time. So I use their time, they're my servants, by learning and turning it around, affirmatively sabotaging, rather than saying, oh, let me do it with a blunt knife because it's Indian, hello. So I think that's stupidity. So therefore, as long as people know that I know that what I'm talking about, I'm not just generalizing Kant. So therefore, the idea of othering for me is the idea that you can, in fact, not other and stay alive. You know what I mean? You can't stay alive without you can't be like completely selfish in the self, you die. So that's my thing. And the idea of claiming citizenship, I completely agree um, with uh, Professor Shivji, whose first name I don't, yes, I said, Isa, Isa. Okay, because I address Sarah as Sarah, so I don't want to call you Professor Shivji, Isa. Okay, see, I'm American. And you would never do this in India. So Isa, <laughs> Isa, the yes, um, as I said before, citizenship is not necessarily good. I'm completely with you. And I asked, have you seen bad citizens, horrible citizens, thieves, etc.? No, I said it was generalizable. And you are tr correct that they become subjects of the state. And therefore, once again, this is Gramsci. Of course, he never got the chance to write a book. They're all notes the, that we see, and therefore perhaps that's why he does it. Everything is medicine and poison. What you teach is how to dose it so that 
it doesn't become poison. The state is like that. I would believe that the state is good. Give me a break. I mean, no, not at all. So it's not just uh, undiluted good. But the subject relationship, unless you're a romantic folklorist, etc. Believe me, the being in subalternity is not an interesting thing. You know, you can from the outside notice that they sing and they dance, etc., which is fine. What I'm doing, and this is to Sarah also, is a terrible thing I'm doing. I'm destroying uh, them and so on. But I want them to have the same rights as we did, completely destroyed. And then we began to uh, rediscover as researchers. You know, great novel by Tara Shankar Banerjee on, uh, called Hashuli Bakir Upokathas, translated by my former student Ben Baer, uh, the tale of the Hashuli Bend or something. Well, he had an MA, and then he went into the Kahar language, etc. I want them to be destroyed and then rediscover in, uh, and through the mainstream, rather than be kept like, you know, uh, there is another sentence which we quote, Bonera Bone Shundar. Shishura Matrikure, 19th century novelist, Bonkim's um, brother. The, the forest dwellers are beautiful in the forest, just as children are in the arms of their mother. I don't want that. I'm from that class. So therefore, I'm doing a wrong thing. But, and they, um, I know, I, I'm not an anthropologist. I don't. <coughs> so, okay, so then, then the next one. Um, and medicine and poison, that's what I would say. You know, you have to, they, I, I don't say they should claim citizenship because this state is using them constantly. I wish I could give you some examples of these non bailable offense things, et cetera, et cetera. But I can't really take that time here. And then um, who is to travel the road? If you are, you see, this is a different situation from Gramsci. Gramsci uh, in his work was trying to make the, uh, the thing that he was writing when he was dragged off to uh, prison was to make peace between the proletarians, the factory workers, uh, he was after all chair of the Communist Party, proletarians and the rural subalterns who knew nothing of this, etc., cetera, from, from the bottom of the top class of which he came. So his father was an Albanian migrant, as you know. So he was not an Albanian migrant, he's uh, fr from an Albanian migrant family. Gramsci is a city in Albania, so Gramsci. So whatever, therefore, this, uh, this is no longer viable. Labor is no longer the agent of change in our, citizenship has become something. So therefore, the road, nobody really travels the road to the subalterns. Believe me, I have not seen another um, urban radical in the area where I have these schools. So therefore, I think the intellectual has to travel, not as an intellectual, but as a disciple are trying to undo, because generally speaking, the people who are in the so-called Dalit, which is a Sanskrit word, my the, uh, people I teach, they don't even know that word. They call themselves SCSDs, scheduled tasks, scheduled tribes. You know, and I say to them, there are two castes. I never tell them any answers. I say, what are the two castes? What are the two castes? No one knew anything because of course we have 3,600 castes. Even these subalterns believe in the caste system. So uh, they couldn't, they couldn't. Then one day, some a person who was not even in the schools from the back in a little voice says, rich and poor. And I said, yes, those are the two castes. I'm rich, you're poor. Don't forget, I'm not in your caste not because I'm a Brahmin. But so therefore, this idea of who is to travel, it is our, uh, might be, it's an intellectual problem. You know, when I, I have to write for the internal revenue system, because I give, of course, thousands of dollars because of, I have to pay all the salaries, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter. I mean, I don't have any dependencies. I'm fine. So uh, the thing is that I have to, I can't make them deductible because I'm a foreigner. These are foreign schools, these are madrasas, not deductible. But I must make it deductible somehow. So I have to write for the internal revenue system. And in fact, Surya helped me write, fill out those forms. And because I was being actually 
audited by the New York State. I mean, they were like killing me. And I had to write that this is an intellectual problem and it is an intellectual problem. And the guy I have now uh, as my the trainee, he came to me because he was interested in my saying that it's an intellectual problem. Can a uh, super educated, quote unquote, half colonial, half European, half nothing, etc. only, you know, by, I mean, I write, I wish I could show you the pages and pages of Bengali writing that you will find in my notebooks. Here it is, writing a, can you see? Can you see? Hey, can it be seen? Yes, That's, we can. So you see, I write my lectures fast. So the thing is that I have to ask myself, like, uh, is, it, it's an intellectual problem. Can someone as from the metropolitan middle class and for them, Calcutta is a metropolis. Can such a person, is it, or is it, uh, going forward from Fanon and Gramsci, not, neither of whom lived long enough, can the, can the so-called super educated intellectual look upon this so-called intellectual ship as a muscle bind, binding problem and is that it, it, this intellectual problem, I mean, I don't put these languages, but I don't have the time to find what I wrote for, uh, for uh, the internal revenue system. So that's what I say. Indeed, uh, it's the intellectual without that word. It's the oppressor who has to travel. And someone asked me about, about uh, chiefs. You see, when the people first went, of course, as you well know, and you know that book that Du Bois criticized, that Du Bois wrote a critique of Raymond Buell, you see the, what's it called? The Problem of the Native or something like that. And so, you know, as you well know, these giving the power to the chiefs had uh, lots of quotations there and that was written so long ago. No, he was not politically correct. The, the, the quotations about how to stop the feeling of one Africa, how to stop the feeling of anything like Pan-Africanism. So that, but, and I don't know anything about it. I've read Mahmoud's book. I've read Citizen Subject, uh, Bali Bar's book. And I've read what is in Du Bois's library. And I read a lot of Du Bois. So therefore, there is no way in which the subaltern actually travels to the intellectual. The subaltern does, uh, is energized in other ways, as we see in uh, Onuradha, um, Arundhati Roy. But that's a very different bag of beans. Mill millenarian Christianity also uh, has uh, enabled the enslaved in, uh, in the United States to because Irele's reading was because it had the teleology. So Du Bois could describe their way of seeing emancipation as a general strike, the um, 100,000 uh, lowering their tools and buzzing off the so-called contraband fugitive soldiers joining the Union Army, but also as understood by the subaltern as the coming of the Lord. That's another, you know, it's like Mao. Who was Mao? He, it, it, it's in Orundhati's um, thing. He was a leader. We are following his vision. So there's a picture of Mao up there. So the thing is, that's a very different ball game of the intellectual going. So let's not use the word intellectual daily. It's a very fine question. But if the subaltern could, do you realize, I teach in India, right? Most of my students have not seen trains. I'm not talking about being on trains. They have not seen trains. And my best female teacher has never been on a train. I mean, think of it, going to the, going to the, one of the students, Lakshmi uh, Lohar, she was frightened because I brought her to a village that's like 45 minutes by motorcycle because I wanted her to share in the common lunch. She was frightened because she was so far away from her village. So therefore, in my context, and perhaps this is not generalizable, and in fact it is not, in my context, the idea of subalterns being pushed into, you know, being pulled, you know, like um, testimonies, cho you choose, and uh, so on and so forth. 
that is not for me a picture that says anything in terms of my own commitment to undoing this kind of, I, I use my privilege. I can't, you can't undo historical privilege. I use my privilege and I say to the uh, students uh, and the supervisors, will you be able to do without the fact that my privilege is now giving, me a lot, giving you a lot of things? I could go on because I speak to them all the time. I just talked to them three days ago. So uh, that's it. Thank you, Gayatri. Um, I'm going to recognize uh, four people. Uh, the first one is Adventino Banjoa. Adventino is a student, a third year student at uh, Makerere Institute of Social Research. Second one is uh, Aslam Farooq Ali. Aslam is from South Africa. Um, he will tell us which university he's at. Uh, third one is uh, Julius Kikoma at uh, Makerere University in the humanities and social sciences. And the fourth person is Gil uh, Anija um, from Columbia University, Professor Gil Anija. So may we begin, Adventino, please? Yeah. Hello? Yes, please. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor, for the lecture. I think my question is quite answered. I wanted to hear from, from Professor Moore on what kind of infrastructure is needed to ensure that the subaltern can be had. Thank you. Fantastic question. Okay. Thank you. Aslam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aslam Farooq Ali. I'm affiliated with the University of Cape Town. Uh, Professor Spivak, perhaps you can say something about uh, the act of silence as an expression of agency. And I'm thinking of one of the characters in the novella who, who has taken a vow of silence, the one who has the, the, the uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the encounter with the pterodactyl. And uh, when he then cho chooses to speak, finally, it is with, uh, you know, a forceful agency. So the dilemma is, uh, what if silence is, is a choice? What if remaining on the margins of history is not necessarily the central dilemma? What does this tell us <clears> about <throat> the, the interlocutor uh, who chooses to speak on behalf of the subaltern? Uh, I think there's a lot to be unpacked uh, specifically in the text on yes. this. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Julius Kikoma. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Spivak. In fact, um, I was listening to another debate uh, about your book on subalternity, and someone actually made a comment, which I wanted you to listen to and see what, what your book, comment what book is. What book is this? Because I uh, never read a book on subaltern. The subaltern speak. Oh, the essay, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, the essay, yeah. And uh, the, the person was saying, actually, the subaltern speak. But the problem is the pr problematic listeners. That means there is someone who listens. There is always a listener to the subaltern. But they listen uh, carefully for what they are interested in. Meaning that they are picking only those things from the subaltern that will further their interests. So. Um, I then ask the question, who listens to the subaltern and at what end? And the second question that uh, I could ask you comes from what you said, uh, that it looks we don't have the infrastructure, the, the subaltern, there is no infrastructure for the subaltern uh, to complete their speech acts. What would be the relevant infrastructure for them to complete their speech acts? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gil Anija. Where are you, Bill? Hey. Uh, Hello. Yes, Gil. Okay. Uh, um, I was being mu mu muted. Hi, Gatri. It's very Hi. good to do. Very good to see you and hear you. I'm uh, uh, I'm 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 grateful for the opportunity. Um, I I I'll try to make this short. Uh, there's a sentence in your response um, where you said that uh, according to Guha, the subaltern um, have a collective voice, and you say I never went that way. 
and I'm wondering whether you can say something about the grammar, because when you speak about the subaltern, there is a plural, the, the grammatical subject seems to be a plural. And I'm wondering whether you can uh, tell us something about the individual versus the collective. As you said, the subaltern is not uh, uh, given the opportunity of becoming a collective, and yet the, the grammatical uh, language that we have seems to be a plural. And I would think that we're not simply coming uh, uh, to an individual voice. Uh, the, the second uh, question, uh, uh, it might not be the occasion, but I would really, really love to hear more about the class you're going to be teaching about mathematics. Um, um, and maybe if you can say something about this, but, um, but, uh, but it leads me to my real question, I suppose, which is that you seem to um, describe the imagination as literary. And it seems to me that mathematics is a form of imagination and the scientists, after all, are sometimes very imaginative in the kinds of weapons, for example, that they produce. And so what, what, what is particular about the imagination that you seem to want to own? You don't qualify it. You say, we are scholars of the imagination. Um, and, um, and then the, the last thing, and it's really a small detail, but you said something about adult learning and you said adults cannot um, cannot learn, and yet, uh, if I can ever think of a living proof to the uh, to the falsity of that statement, it would be you yourself. You are constantly learning, and clearly, age is not uh, the limit. Uh, and yet, you were saying I can only teach small children because they are wet cement, but uh, but adults are you know stuck. They become uh, um, I don't remember what phrase you use, but surely you are an example. To the possibility of learning. Okay, that's good. my question. Good, thanks. Wonderful questions. I want to begin with the Cape Town question. Uh, this is Aslam Farooq Ali. Is that Cape Town? That's right. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll begin with that because that takes us to the text. The right to be silent is obviously a right to be silent, but uh, uh, of course one must acknowledge it that you could not uh, you could not uh, move the uh, the person or groups into a response. That's responsibility. So absolutely, you must acknowledge that you did something, you, you're not there. But what is there in that silent thing, I hope I can get, Surya, do you know what page that was where, uh, tomatoes? 157. 157, okay. So you see what is, first of all, in the book, there is a whole text of how Puran, the journalist, is accepted, okay? And the, first of all, you know, he goes, he stays, he says this and he says that. He has a conversation, long conversation. This guy talks a lot, Shankar, the only literate person in the whole group. This is a real, he is, however, also a subaltern, and is victorious at the end of the, so it's also his story. He's victorious at the end of the novel when he says, we are okay, we are the ancestors have spoken, etc." So to an extent, when I was talking about, you know, uh, being a Calcuttan who's also New Yorker, etc., how do we do these things, etc. the question, right? So th that's, so that's something else. But Puran himself is accepted by, first of all, He's in with them after all, uh, after a lot of toing and froing, and he's being asked a question, and he does not know the answer. And later, you'll find it in the text. Later, Shankar tells him that he has entered their mythology because he has. Once he came in, it started raining. So therefore, it's not like they take this as science or anything, but it's a sign. I know because we have also these kinds of, mind you, I'm not um, a subaltern, but nonetheless, you know, Hinduism, I'm an atheist, but on the other hand, superstition dies fast. So therefore, it, the, it's, uh, it, so this happens. It was, it's at that point, since Shankar tells him separately, at that point when he doesn't know the answer and he cries because he can't tell, that's when he's accepted. That's when Bhikya takes him in, takes him in, takes him in. And the, he, uh, he, has, he is in that room with the pterodactyl. 
And that is on page 157, an example, an example Islam of, quote, reading, unquote. When we read, we, uh, the text, in fact, although we may think it's answering back, it does not answer back. So it's the, it, it, to that extent, it's the death of the author. But we go as far as we can into the text. Gil, it's a little bit uh, an answer to your question of the literary imagination. We surrender ourselves, go as far as we can into the text so that we speak. And this is a, this is a thing uh, of uh, uh, indirect discourse, free indirect discourse, that passage, where the pterodactyl, like a text, does not speak. But Puran has finally earned the right in that place face to face to read it as we read a text. It, and so he says, and it's again and again, there is no communication between eyes. This is imaginative activism, whereas so-called digital, they turn everything into empirical so that you can feel you're really there type thing. The, the reading uh, in an old fashioned way, not just written texts, but the kinds of oral texts I'm talking about written in the memory, that is much more dangerous. So, because there is no commu communication between eyes, it's without guarantees. So, uh, no uh, truth claim. So, there is only a dusky waiting without end. What does it want to tell? And then is, comes the reading. We are extinct by the neo inevitable natural geological evolution. Our extinction is planetary. Yes, we are extinct. You too are endangered, but your extinction is different. You too will be, this is what he's reading. So the silence is the silence of a text there. You too will become extinct. And that's why she has, Mahasweta has this kind of a uh, Mesozoic animal, because the silence is not construed as just a human being falling silent. I won't talk to you. No, this is a science fiction where the text is geological. So uh, you too will become extinct in nuclear explosions or in war or in the aggressive advance of the strong as it obliterates the weak, which finally turns you naked, barbaric, primitive. Think if you're going forward or back. Forests are extinct and animal life is obliterated outside of zoos and protected forest sanctuaries. What will you finally grow in the soil, having murdered nature in the application of man-imposed substitutes? Quote, he puts a quote there. This is, again, if we read it rhetorically, this is a signal that he's approaching the readership almost more by surrendering himself. The, and the author gives this, Mahasweta, gives this rhetorical signal by quote, Deadly DDT germs, greens. You know, those of you who have read Voloshin of Marxism and the philosophy of language know very well that he thought that we should, generic divisions should be in terms of, this, of steps of reported speech. Remember that as you read this. Deadly DDT greens, charnel house vegeta vegetables, uprooted astonished onions, some uh, radioactive potatoes, Explosive bean pods, and spastic, uh, spastic gourds, eggplants with mobile tails, bloodthirsty octopus creepers, animal blood filled tomatoes. Okay, so that's the end of it. He's reading. So, but there's more. Um, there's more, but that's the that's the real example of reading. So this one, Aslam, is not just any old silence. It's a textual blank created by the, by the author. There, and this is a literary representation. It's a novella. So absolutely, the, but the right to silence is a failure of responsibility. So uh, the, um, then what kind of infrastructure? Um, well, the, I don't know what kind of infrastructure. It depends, you see, that's what I'm trying to learn. It's infrastructure is both in individual listening, individual work, but it's also infrastructure in terms of collective work. And uh, someone who said that uh, the development listens, I mean, I talked about development therefore, they certainly listen, 
And you know, when I go to these development meetings, uh, sometimes I'm invited as the only humanities person. I'm very quiet because, of course, since I don't have anything written about all of this, they think I'm an ivory tower person. And so very humbly, I ask the agricultural people from these universities, which really want to have better university structures, which is fine. I ask them, do you actually uh, get in touch with the people? And they say, yes. And I said, please tell me. So we train research assistants. And after all of the data has come in, we send out the research assistants to uh, validate the data to see. And I asked, the, and mind you, I'm talking about maybe 50, 60 examples here. I mean, I'm old, as I like Gil pointed out. So the answer to the question, when I say, is there ever a surprise? The answer has always been no. So, you know, Anthony Appiah was kind enough to quote me once in the New York Times saying that he really liked what I said. It's not who speaks, but who listens. <laughs> more, more important to me. Otherwise, we are always preaching to the choir. And as you say, on the other side, the development lobby listens to what they want to hear. So therefore, yes, uh, the, it's not, uh, you're not telling me anything new uh, by saying that people, remember what I said about the essay. First of all, I criticized it way at the beginning that it was a result of a metropolitan migrant. It was like Edward said, saying to me, he suddenly realized he was orientalized and he, he was a much greater guy than I was. But this is a metropolitan immigrant's identity crisis. I diagnosed the bloody thing uh, as belonging to that kind of US leftist idea of colonialism. So what can you say negative about this that I haven't said stronger? So I think you should take a holiday on that one. Who listens? I don't know. Or with all of this, all of this activism and confronting the, uh, the um, governments here, there and everywhere. I don't speak on behalf of anyone. But, and that's also a mistake. I, I don't speak on behalf of anyone. But I am their servant to an extent so that I bring some facts about, you know, Ujjal Lohar and his non-bailable offenses, which he's now, he can't go home now for six months. So I am there, I bring it to the, I bring it to the uh, thing, or um, uh, Nur Jahan's uh, thing, um, um, son dragging the woman with a, with a hair across stubble and Nujan saying to me, you talk to the panchayat, tell them that this son of mine, this is the third woman that he's uh, doing this to. And when I say it to the panchayat, they say, domestic violence is not a tribal issue. Okay. So therefore, uh, I certainly know that this is a problem. But then the, um, uh, so the problematic listener, yes, what else is new? I mean, the, how is that a critique of my essay? I even said that the, uh, what I was saying there was that she spoke. And it's not that she completes her speech act. We have to complete it in order for the speech act to, to, be, to exist. That's why she cannot speak. It's not her problem. She spoke with her body in extremis. I've understood suicide uh, as a weapon with this um, great aunt of mine. She was 17 years old. She waited so that she could prove she left a letter for her sister, my grandmother, and which was to be opened in 60 years because she didn't know when the British would leave India. So it's not like that she didn't speak, but uh, that was the point. It was the rhetoric of rage that said that, that if you didn't hear me, I, that was the, and I said that people did not read that rhetoric because they were so uh, they were, they're not trained to read rhetorical signals. So I shouldn't have done that. My editors should have said, you write it down there that she spoke, but she couldn't be heard, etc., etc., so that everyone understands. My fault. But certainly uh, the idea that this is a critique of my uh, essay, I think you, it, it's too late. Too late, too little. Then in, in the Gil, I didn't, what I said was, I, I, if I said, the other thing that I was, uh, I made a mistake in saying this. What I said was that I I'm not interested in colonial um, uh, subalterns. I didn't go there because colonialism for me, it's a very wonderful thing to study and to sh see how extraordinarily they were, how incredibly uh, uh, cruel uh, and how incredibly 
exploitative and dominant, etc., how hegemonic they were. But I find as a result of what's happening now, because these people, these folks where I teach, they have never seen white people. They, when, they, when Ben went there, they saw Ben had a disease. They thought Ben had a disease. So uh, the thing is that uh, colonialism doesn't mean anything to them. Although, of course, I always speak on, on uh, Independence Day. I asked a young uh, girl, small girl, school, uh, what is Independence Day? Sure. We have we defeated the British that day. So I said, have you ever seen British? Who are the British? I don't know. So I said, what did the British do? Said, they didn't let us celebrate Independence Day, she said. Well, correct answer. But you see, this is colonialism, which is why Dalits, in fact, prefer the way, because I went to a school where I was taught by Christianized outcasts, Christianized Dalits. My teachers, my parents were, were, uh, were uh, smart enough to send me to diocese, where our, um, but they were Christianized, right? And so, therefore, it's hard for me not to acknowledge that we, the Brahmins, treated them like animals before they were Christianized. So therefore, I'm not for um, the colon colonials, but there's complicity here. So therefore, the colonial subaltern is not my thing, is what I said. As for the imagination, you know, I say certainly that no great work can be done without the imagination. You don't even have to be literate. See, that's the whole thing, teaching these people. The, the imagination doesn't die. You know, it's of course contextualized, but you can, and you know, uh, people, because people are as they are, some are tall, some are short, some have stronger imagination, some have been ruined, et cetera, et cetera. But you can, you, when you see it at work, you realize, uh, you, you're surprised. That you feel you've passed an exam. See what I mean? There are many examples again, but I can't give them. So what I, I certainly don't think the imagination is tied to the literary, but this kind of uh, nature of using nothing but this imaginative activism, in other words, uh, making the imagination more flexible, moving more and more and more toward giving as much as, I mean, you resist, I mean, it's very hard to resist the, uh, the wanting to understand by making familiar. It happens to me too. It's not something that I've, uh, anybody can really uh, win over, but in, you know, it's like mitweg sein, right? You, uh, that particular thing, that's uh, uh, among this taxonomy, that is all we have to t teach. That is all that we have to teach. I do not teach any subject matter, I have to, but on the model of cross-examining reading the text, on the model of history, bad history, one example of a novel is proving all kinds of social scientific truths about a culture, etc. This is, cultural study has become like that, right? It's taken, anthropology is bad, they did it. But believe me, even their bad politics, they prepared more. And now today, with the disciplinary critique, anthropology is in a different place. Cultural studies, I can talk about my culture. All about the critical stuff that we developed that when you talk about your culture, immediately you're distanced because it's, to take Sarah's word, othered. Culture alive is its own counterexample because it keeps, it keeps moving away from how you summarize it as you must do. So therefore, that's, that's the imagination bit, right? And so uh, the individual, as I said, what I did after writing can the subaltern speak and realizing what it was slowly, slowly. In 84, I mean, I gave the talk in 83. In 84, I went into collectives, subaltern groups uh, on the margins of history. What does it mean to be on the margins of history? That generalizations are made by Ramachandra Guha, by many others. I'm only mentioning his name because he has irritated me recently, but uh, you know, by people, generalizations are made and you can see that these people do not know the largest sector of the electorate. They have no idea, they have not earned the right to hang in with them. And they don't know how these people criticize the ruling class because they know 
that they're not stupid. They may be subaltern, but they ain't stupid. They know that the ru ruling class, if they come by and they're, oh, you're so wonderful. And their real technique is to say yes. This is a centuries old technique. The ruling class is absurd. It can say any damn thing. All you do is smile and say yes. And so that's a photo op. And you can take that photo op and show it to the world and say, see, 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 I was there. But then when they leave, if you have been hanging around with them and you know you have discussed all of this, they without thinking start criticizing what they were saying. You know, like I remember, I won't mention her name, but uh, she was a good person. These people are not bad people, except they're clueless. You know, she was saying to them, Gram! To me, shahor ke balo, shahor to me. That is village. You say to the city, city. You do this, do that. Okay. And so once she and there's <laughs> once once she left, you know, we were being very nice to her. As a what a nice woman, especially since she's brought she brought sweets. What a nice woman. What was she talking about? See what I mean? So if they're not stupid, and their rule because the ruling class can also whip them if they're wearing, I've, I've been told this by one of the old guys there. And that's why I'm with the Communist Party Marxist in that corner of the world. You know, the Didi, I'm walking here with shoes on my feet. You see that guy? The, he would whip me for wearing shoes and take my shoes away. So I said, well, how, what changed it? And so the older guy, so he looks at me and says, party. See what I mean? So they did do something. And so therefore, yes, it's absolutely true that the imagination I mean, I earned the right for him as I was walking to this little pocket handkerchief of sharecropping for him to share this with me because I could also be a person who whipped him. So therefore, the idea of this imagination, you know, Wordsworth says in his lyrical ballads intro, that is a bullshit of course, but he says that he introduced meter because his poetic imagination was so strong it went out so far that if the reader went out so far, they might get into delusion. This is a kind of self-serving, I mean, he consumed uh, the agricultural uh, spaces, it didn't produce within except uh, primitive accumulation production. But the thing is, this is one extreme self-serving way of describing what I'm describing. And adults. Adults can learn. It's not, that's not a problem. But you know, when, so it is, but adults, I mean, I uh, take Paulo Freire's uh, advice well, except of course, once he was kicked out of Brazil, he was obliged to join the Lutherans and so on, and everything kind of changed. But it changes. And once I'm kicked out, I'll probably also join the Lutherans, who knows. But uh, so therefore, the um, adults can learn. Of course they can learn. But it's harder to, you know, uncoercive rearrangement of desire. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very hard to actually rearrange. They think minds are changed. Minds are changed like nothing. I've been teaching for 54 years. I changed one mind and he was shot to death. And the, um, the FBI did not allow videographic evidence. See, Greensboro Five. So that's, this changing minds is hard. It was because he was what he was. But the thing is, this rearrangement of desire, you really have to know a group well, which is why I said, can't be done in a lecture. And so that you have a like pre-psychoanalytic, wild psychoanalysis kind of idea with all wrong sometimes, a sense of general patterns of desire so that you teach, and this is where my math, mathematics buddy and I are going to, he's going to dismiss me because I'm a woman. But on the other hand, <laughs> alas, that's what it's going to be. You know, these are like, but th there you can do, but it's very, very hard. Or everything is hard, this rearrangement of desire. But with the kids, with the, I mean, the small children, I wish I could go in and it's actually, I just, just have 10 minutes to 12 now. So I, of the ways in which, some of the ways in which I try perhaps wrongly to think about what the intuitions of democracy are. 
it's hard because you know, wonderful questions. Do you, I've tried to answer all. Thank you, Gayatri. Um, I wonder if we um, can do a last round of three questions or? As long as you think I can answer in 10 minutes. The answer, question's got to be brief. Yes. I mean, I don't have to go in 10 minutes, but you have until 12, right? I'm sitting at my well, desk. Yeah, we can, we, can, we can take another extra five minutes or so, 10 minutes, whatever. So it, it's really all on your, your discretion. Um, so I have three people here. I have to apologize to everybody else. There have been lots of people on, uh, on, on chat. Um, Yosef uh, Jamberi. Uh, Yosef is a student, a uh, fourth year student at Miser. Miser is the acronym for Makerere Institute. I bet I got yes. Research, yes. Uh, Robin Adams uh, from uh, University of Cape Town and uh, Samson Bezabe, research fellow teaching at Miser. Um, Yosef? Okay. Would you like to begin, please? Yeah, I didn't take the names down. I didn't. Uh, it's 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 Yosef. Yosef and uh, Robin. Robin and Samson. And Samson. Yeah. Okay. Very good. We'll begin with Yosef. Okay. Thank you, Professor Spivak, for giving us the opportunity, uh, the honor to listen to you. So I have two brief questions. Um, first. If the road to subalternity cannot be traveled as a researcher, as, a, as an intellectual, does this mean that it is a scandalous mistake to think of subaltern studies as a research methodology? Uh, is this some kind of a contradiction in terms to speak of subaltern studies or subaltern research methodology? The second question is, uh, we okay. read the two. Maximum okay. two, maximum two, okay? No third question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, we read the two texts uh, you sent us, and uh, the conversation we are having is uh, comparing uh, Arun, Arundhati Roy and the character of Puran Sahai. Who is more or less a better disciple, according to you, or do both fail? as a disciple, or, and who is a good disciple? Thank you very much, Professor. Robin? Hi, Professor Spivak. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It's such an honor. Um, my question has please, in part- please, Robin, hey, show me your face. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, can you yeah. see me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, your question, my question in part has been answered. Um, already, but uh, I was wondering if you mentioned and illuminated some interesting things regarding um, the knowing the subaltern and your deviation away from the colonial and the colonial archives. Um, and your, your 1987 uh, essay, Subaltern, uh, the Deconstructing Historiography essay. I was wondering so, if- you That's I've ever written. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If you had any, um, okay. it's really bad. Yeah, go ahead. Critiques or um, anything you'd add to that in terms of writing from the archive, especially regarding court documents. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> yes, Samson. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Samson. Uh, first, I would like to to thank you for the opportunity that we got. Uh, my question is rather uh, simple, and, and I'm an anthropologist by training. So I was uh, listening to you and, of course, reading your material. I was thinking of the recent turn in anthropology, what they call uh, this ontological turn. And particularly, I was thinking of um, the, the work of Vivero de Castro and Bruno Latour, and um, this idea of perspectivism, of inhabiting different worlds. So I was... Do you think that, in the first place, what would be your critique or your engagement with this work? Like, uh, what would be your reflection? I would be very much interested to hear that. Um, do you see an overlap with your own work, um, particularly your work on subaltern and perspectivism as developed by uh, Vivero de Castro? Thank you. Okay. Um, as for um, the path, Joseph's question, 
as a researcher, of course it can be traveled. Of course, I mean, it so happens. I mean, of course they can be studied um, uh, anthropologically. It's just, I mean, uh, they, they have to be studied carefully in terms of, uh, you know, in fact, uh, uh, Samson just mentioned uh, two of the top level people who are rethinking anthropology, but in fact, the disciplinary critique of anthropology started some time ago. I'm not censoring any way of studying them. I just uh, felt that this other kind of work, really so much studying the subaltern, you see, but it is much more trying to find ways in which making mistakes constantly, and here Gil was very sweet and he said, you know, I'm an adult learner. Yes, indeed, I'm adult, more than adult, I'm 78 and three months. So, uh, you know, this uh, particular way of uh, uh, working for them, that's uh, working for them, not speaking for them. But that's a path, that's for me, a literary person, an intellectual problem of, and I use the fact that the imagination doesn't die like that, because the imagination is neither rational nor irrational. It's something else. And so this is a very recent, I mean, it's not so easy to access either, because certainly there's no theory of imagination. I just did this thing for Europeans, and I had, I spoke about the Rohingyas, as I always do, I began with them, and I had a little piece um, uh, that had been sent to me by an art historian friend with Ai Weiwei, a kind of thing, a lined piece of paper, just a, a kind of scratch pad, on which was written in his hand, Rohingyas, and then something I presume in Arabic. And I said to my uh, audience, I do not think it is my primary task to teach the my uh, students and teachers how to understand something called quote art unquote because they will see this and they will see that somebody has written something on a piece of scratch pad i'm not interested in showing them how this is dissident art by ai weiwei so to an extent the um those kinds of tasks are not my tasks and people who claim that art therapy really works, they should actually get into places where the word art has no, I, certainly it has synonyms, but if, if I use the word for art there, which is kola, they will think I'm talking about a banana. But so, uh, therefore, it, there is that problem. And one of the things that I, re I never read poetry to them because they, uh, they uh, memorize poetry. I teach mathematics like liter the literary deal, you know, the decimal system. I wish I could talk about it now, but I can't, it'll take too long. But so I don't read poetry, but Shankho Ghosh, 10 years older than I, a real activist poet who wrote a poem called Mati or Land in response to this withdrawal of citizenship from Muslims, the CABs and, and so on in uh, in uh, India, I didn't even think about it. I read it to Nimai Lohar and Ujjal Lohar in my Bodhanathpur school as they were sitting on the floor there. And I didn't even think that I was reading poetry. And the poem is such that they grasped it. And so it can make something. It's not like a simply written poem so subalterns can understand. F uh, f uh, uh, there came a moment when the, uh, the, the Muslim woman is speaking about Ognipurikha, and I had to say that, you know, this is Sita, and Ram is now the king of modern India, so it's a Muslim Sita, this I had to say. This I had a little explain, explanation. But so, therefore, the, uh, I won't say, Yosef, that uh, it can't be anthropologically, they can't be studied, but that's not my task. It doesn't interest me. I think the subaltern can certainly be studied anyway. So, and uh, otherwise the development folks are really studying the hell out of them. Okay, so like someone said last, uh, okay. Then comparing, 
Now remember, we can't really compare Orundhati Rai to Puran Shahai because uh, the, uh, f the figure in uh, the novella, it's a, a literary representation of a, a character, okay? So, uh, so we can read him and we can certainly say that Orundhati Roy, who is a wonderful person, committed person, uh, is, as I tried to say, in that walking with the comrades, she does not lose her uh, middle-class romanticization and she does not lose her, uh, I mean, sometimes she does have a slight bit of uh, irony toward this figure. So she's even capable of being ironic uh, in the situation. Well, what happened to my, is what happened to the, oh, this is someone else. Okay, sorry. But uh, ironic, uh, she's capable of self-irony, which is, of course, also somewhat control, etc. So if you wanted me to compare, I would say that the representation of Puran, who doesn't just go there like a Dr. Livingston and then leave and uh, admire the, um, admire the, uh, uh, these folks in working, uh, rewriting, being cannon fodder into a uh, um, resistance figure, quite violent themselves, violence breeds violence, so that's how it goes. I think her um, uh, character, if one can make such a comparison, is quite different from Puran's whose effort to, as it is represented, is uh, to enter uh, that area and then write the report, we have the report, but then decide or not decide, it's not sure that he's, and that is also quite interesting. You make up your mind not to send it. The report not sent, but we have it. That's a re really rather a different trajectory that Mahasweta is writing about the same place, Chhattisgarh. She is not a she has written historical fiction where she's very wonderful historical fiction, the Queen of Jhansi, for example, one of her first books, where she is very careful about historical detail. But here she drags us away and only for someone who has, who knows what's going on, does she leave a clue that name Abu Jamar, mountains that cannot be understood, right in the middle as a, as a just passing mention and then move on. So that she's sort of telling us, in spite of her note, this is not a real place, this is not a, a real tribe, this is not an anything, this is all of India, etc. That is also part of the text because there's that name Abujmar right in the name. So uh, I would have to say, if one could compare, that I learn more uh, for, from reading a literary work like this, which does in fact teach me, if you like, something about, the, someone talked about the right to be silent, Aslam, and uh, it does teach me, teach my global classroom in the superpower, the first right of the ones that they want to help is the right to refuse. That's what Shankar does. Shankar refuses, the only literate person. It's a very different kind of encounter from, oh sister, oh sister, thousand stars, I'm in a five star, etc. It's nice, I like Arunati Rai. She's very effective. But now, the very last one, which was about um, <clears throat> Bruno Tour Castro. Now, I uh, don't do, of course, anthropology, um, Samson. I don't know how to do anthropology and I'm not very interested in, that's, that doesn't make anthropology bad. I just don't have, I notice I don't have anthropological curiosity. What I like is not necessarily good. I think many people make that mistake. Because I don't like, like it, therefore it's bad. But you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, because mine, so, so, you see, I live in a, what used to be a working class area. Uh, it's now slowly getting gentrified. 
So the internet connection, although I have the best internet connection, the plugs and stuff in the basement are bad. So my internet fails all the time, <laughs> okay? So it says launching, please click to open Zoom meetings, etc. on my computer. But anyway, so I am not really, and also I'm not, see the way I teach theory to my students is, and I don't really teach them a lot of theory. I teach them and I ask them to read theory as if uh, it's being, it, it, as if it's new, as if it's a piece of creative writing, so that you can begin to see it as a text written by someone, and so that you can perhaps, uh, so that what I really want you to do is to be so careful, I mean, read it in a literary way, so that it becomes part of your mental furniture, and so you don't walk out to apply it, because if you apply a theory, the text will become that th example of that theory. That's just a fact. So therefore, you know, I, when I, people talk to me about deconstruction, well, deconstruction certainly I learned as well as I could and I still haven't finished. And, you know, I read Balibar, all of these people, but what I do, I call reading, not anything else. So it's, therefore, I don't use a lot of uh, the uh, new anthropological texts. I read them, but they don't speak to me that much because I think uh, the idea of European control in the case of Latour has not disappeared. I like him very much. Don't worry about it. We are at conferences together. I think he's fantastic and certainly much smarter than I. No problem. But uh, the thing is, and much uh, has a very broad spectrum of sphere of influence and as it should be. But I don't, I find in the interstices of his writing a kind of uh, right to be critical of my, of Europe in a European way, which doesn't speak to me. So that's it for the answers. And I have taken seven minutes more. Thank you so much, Gayatri. Um, just a couple of words before I close this. Uh, some of you have uh, asked for a copy of the recording. Uh, I think uh, Javi will be in touch with you. Um, uh, Gayatri, uh, thank you so much um, for being extraordinarily generous uh, <laughs> and, and patient uh, with, uh, with us uh, uh, turning one question into three or sometimes four questions, uh, but giving each of them uh, due consideration. Uh, it's 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 been uh, it's been a great occasion, uh, especially for for us at Makerere Institute of Social Research. Although I'm speaking from New York City, uh, but that's the lockdown. Um, thank you on behalf of all of us. And uh, when the lockdown is not there, we look forward to welcoming you in person at Miser. I really want to go. I mean, you know, Thank I mean, you. all those friends of mine taught there. I mean, it's a place for me to visit. I, I hope I can come after lockdown. I certainly hope so. And we'll try and make it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Thank you, Gayatri. And uh, thanks to everybody. See you next Wednesday, Professor Robert Meister. And thank I'm you. Okay.